Joyce Parker. We're going to see a lot of familiar names tonight. Hey, there we are. Hey, good evening, everybody. Hi. Hey, Skylar. As a uh, city council celebrity, welcome to Hollywood Squares. <laughs> Thank you. So I believe we are still missing a representative from the city attorney's office. Um, if we'd like to hold for just another moment, Richard, do you happen to know which of the gentlemen is working with us this evening? You're on mute right now. Sorry, it is a gentlewoman. Her name is Monica Castillo. Um, and oh, she, well, then she is know, here, and we just didn't realize it was her. So yes. Um, Alex and Parker, if you could enable her video. Hi. Perfect. Thank you. I'm sorry, I did not get that memo. <laughs> no problem. I was like, I can't get on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dennis, I think we're good to go now. It looks like you're muted, you're Dennis. I think you're muted, Dennis. Dennis, you're muted. Can you hear us? You're muted. We hear nothing. You're, yeah, your speaker uh, might need to be reconnected. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we good? Perfect. There you go. Thank okay. you. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I've got that new speaker. You know, I've got that $12 million mic here just in case I become famous. <laughs> okay. Sorry, guys and uh, girls. Uh, good evening, friends and neighbors. I would like to call order the Malibu Planning Commission regular meeting. Uh, date of January 17, 2023. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Commissioners and city staff are participating in this Zoom meeting from remote, remote locations. All votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org slash virtual meeting. At that screen, click on one of two tabs to either watch or sign up to speak on particular items. Those wishing to speak must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Please sign up before the item has been called by the chair, me. Those wishing to defer time to someone else intending to speak are not required to sign up but must be present in the meeting. If instead of speaking you wish to donate your time to another speaker, please click the raise hand button at the bottom of the Zoom screen when the public hearing for the item is open. A speaker may accept up to five additional minutes, one minute each from each speaker that defers time for a maximum total of eight minutes. And there you have it right there on your screen. Alex, would you please slow, show the slide, which you are. Commissioners, when you have comments, please raise your hand and I will call you in turn so we may make our discussion clear for the record and for the public. May I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Hill. Here. Commissioner Jennings. Here. Commissioner Peak. Here. Vice Chair Mazza. Here. Chair Smith. Here. You have a quorum. Okay. Uh, first, first 
part of business here is uh, may I have a report on the posting of the agenda, please. The agenda for the meeting was properly posted on January 6, 2023. The amended agenda was properly posted on January 10th, 2023. Okay. Well, we come to the point in our program uh, on number one for ceremonial presentations and A is administer oath to office to our newly appointed commissioners. Excuse me, Chairman. Uh, we did not approve the agenda. Oh, very sorry, uh, Vice Chair uh, Mazza. Thank you. Um, I make a motion to approve the agenda with item 5B continued to a date uncertain. I'll second that. Vice Chair Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Peek? Yes. Chair Smith. Yes. I do see why you were thinking about going in a different order this evening, Chair Smith, um, just so we officially swear in Commissioner Peak. But I don't, I yes. think that's kind of um, the motion carries. <laughs> a point of order? Yes. Uh, we have a quorum without uh, Skyler. Yes, so, I'm uh, just, I'm going to mark it as being um, a forum that approved the agenda and that will move on to 1A. No, what I'm saying is, uh, I think his vote should be stricken since he's not a commission member yet. Which is, yes, I agree. And I'm doing that for this particular vote. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, Mr. Jennings, I, I assume is, is, I assume his oath from the last term is still good, I guess. I don't know. Um, we typically, I was told, still go with an oath every time you're appointed. So that's the direction that I was given. Okay. Yeah, the, so it's, it's the three commissioners, commissioners serve until their replacement is appointed. So His vote would I'm count still... on the last item, but he will also take the oath this evening. Okay, we're good. Okay, let's, um, well, we've, uh, without further ado, uh, we have to, we will administer the oath for the newly appointed commissioners. And I believe um, soon to be Commissioner Peak here in a couple of minutes, uh, you have someone that uh, is gonna read your, or help work, or have you with you to read all the, the amendment that you read and are you doing this and Rebecca's going to read it to you or how do you want to do this? Um, I can have Rebecca read it to me. I would have the dogs speak, but I don't think <laughs> you can understand it. <laughs> yeah, okay. It may, may surprise you. <laughs> and we're actually going to begin with Commissioner Jennings just because he's alphabetically first. Okay. <laughs> Planning Commission appointee Jennings, please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Jeffrey Jennings. I, Jeffrey do, Jennings. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will diligently serve. That I will diligently serve. As Planning Commissioner of the City of Malibu. As Planning Commissioner of the City of Malibu. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the State of California. To the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Thank you, Commissioner Jennings. And now uh, Planning Commission appointee Peek, if you would raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Skylar Peek. I, Skylar Peek. Do you solemnly swear or affirm do solemnly swear or affirm that I will diligently serve as planning commissioner of the city of Malibu, that I will diligently serve as planning commissioner of the city of Malibu, 
That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the State of California. To the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Well, thank you very much and welcome to back Commissioner Jennings and welcome Commissioner Peak. Thank you, Rebecca. Welcome. Commissioner Peak, you just couldn't stay out of the fray, could you? I don't know. I'm trying to be like Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can, you're going to basically outlive both of us. So, <laughs> so welcome. Welcome to everyone. We're back. It's very nice. Um, I guess when we do our commissioner comments, we'll let everybody have their, their little say about uh, their life and how that's going. Um, right now on, uh, on number one, uh, we have B, we have a planning consultant introduction which uh, I think is uh, great, actually. We, I'm looking at uh, quite a few names on the, our screen here on page one and two that I recognize. So I, I would imagine, Director Malika, is this, uh, is this something you're gonna do for us? I believe uh, one of my staff, I'm looking for her here, but essentially what we were gonna do was have each of our consultants just Kind of get on and give just a quick introduction and let you know, uh, you know, who they are, uh, quick background, and, and mainly this is just so you can see their face and know some of the folks that you're dealing with uh, when you phone, call us uh, or read the staff report. Because as you know, the past year has been um, extremely high turnover in the department, and we're very appreciative of the council. Okaying a budget amendment for the department so that we're able to get all of these consultants here to help out with this because at present uh, we we are able to uh, retain a new associate planner. Uh, but other than that, you had 3 senior planners pretty much uh, doing all the work <laughs> that you see, uh, which is, uh, you know, quite impressive considering that normally. Uh, you know, there's a handful of uh, associates, uh, assistant planners, and then, you know, maybe one or two seniors. Uh, these folks are doing the work of three or four people each. So uh, tonight would like to go through and, you know, we've got Joyce has her camera on. And we'll if, we could, if we could ask um, all of our contract planners in the meeting to go ahead and start your videos. And then Alex is going to put up a slide with the contact information uh, for each of the contract planners. Mm -hmm. And Alex, could you display the PowerPoint? Next slide. And over to you, Joyce. All right, thank you. I think each of you know who I am, but my name is Joyce Parker Bozolinski, and I have over 35 years of experience in the planning field, uh, seven of those with the city of Malibu as uh, the planning director, including a time in the early 1990s in which the city was adopting their first general plan, and I helped shepherd through the uh, city's first general plan. I am currently working uh, for the city on long range or advanced planning projects, and that includes municipal code amendments and local coastal program amendments. Currently, I am working on the uh, city's ADU or accessory dwelling unit ordinance and the short term rental ordinance. I also uh, monitor and uh, respond to uh, public projects that are being proposed by outside public agencies. 
Thank you, Joyce. Next slide. I saw Rick on there. Yeah, I'm scrolling okay. through. Oh, there is we go. that uh, coming there through now? Yes, it is. <laughs> Thank you. you. Excellent. I'm glad you enjoyed my uh, my impression there. So good evening, commissioners. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. So my name is Rick Caswell. I'm principal of Caswell Consulting. I have four years of consulting experience and a total of 15 years of planning experience, which includes a master's degree in city and regional planning from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. So my emphasis has primarily been on architectural design review and site planning analysis for current planning projects and coastal planning. So that's going to be my focus here um, at Malibu, where I've been for the last couple of months now. Uh, previous positions have included senior planner at the city of Avondale and community of Rancho Santa Fe, coastal analyst at the California Coastal Commission, as well as being a planner for um, cities of Del Mar, um, Westlake Village, Calabasas, and also uh, Malibu for a year um, some years ago. A few major projects that I've overseen have included the shops at Westlake Village, which is uh, approximately a 240,000 square foot uh, retail shopping center there in Westlake Village, uh, 135 lot single family subdivision in Avondale, uh, as well as numerous CDPs for single family residences and uh, other coastal related development um, throughout uh, Southern California. So I look forward to continuing my work here at Malibu. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Rick. <clears throat> Next slide. Hi, it's it's Allison Cook, and I can get my video on. I'm, I don't have that option, actually. Mm -hmm. it's, I don't know what's going on here, but I apologize for that. Um, but I've been a planner for 33 years, um, almost all in the public sector. Most recently, I was the assistant planning director for the city of Agoura Hills, and I retired from that job last year and began doing freelance consulting, and my firm's called Capstone City mm -hmm. Planning. I specialize mostly in long range planning, writing general plans, specific plans, zoning ordinance amendments and objective design standards, but I also have a lot of experience in current development plan review. Uh, I am based in Cambrio, pretty nearby, and I am very excited and happy to be mm -hmm. helping Malibu in this way. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Next slide. Um. Good evening, Chair and Commissioners. I'm Jerry Hittleman with Rincon Consultants. I've been in the planning environmental field for over 40 years, starting in the Denver metro area, then the city of San Diego, where I was fortunate to work with Mary Wright, who was also on the team, and you'll hear from later in the introductions. I worked for the city of Oceanside, and upon moving to Los Angeles, I worked for the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, LASA, uh, City of Santa Monica and Malibu for a year where I had the privilege of working with Joyce, Richard, and Adrian and Patricia. I now live in Ventura County and work with Rincon Consultants as a senior contract planner where I have assisted Malibu planning with various projects, including the Malibu Jewish Center renovation and the city's wireless ordinance update coastal impact analysis and findings with Adrian. I'm grateful to be here and look forward to continuing to work with the Malibu planning team. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Next slide. Good evening, commissioners. My name is John Cameron, and I bring over 14 years of professional planning experience and environmental service experience for cities, including the uh, city of Oceanside, Encinitas, and San Diego. I have also worked with the Department of Defense and private clients. I specialize in NEPA and CEQA analysis, and I've provided complex planning solutions for cities uh, throughout Southern California. I have also received an Association of Environmental uh, Professionals Award for a PA for sdg and &E. And I'm excited to work for the city of Malibu and uh, very uh, grateful for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, John. Next slide, please. Good evening, commissioners. <clears throat> I'm Nader Khalil, an associate planner at CSG Consultants. 
I have a master's uh, in urban planning from beautiful Cal State University, Northridge. Um, over two years of professional experience in staff augmentation and two years in environmental planning, working on CEQA documents. Uh, I'll be applying my analytical skills, ability to work collaboratively and understanding of the technical and regulatory aspects of urban development as part of the city of Malibu team to help applicants reach their planning needs and goals. Mm -hmm. And uh, I look forward to working with everyone. Thank you, Nadir and go Matadors. Next slide, please. <laughs> Good evening, commissioners. My name is Adam Bazarkowitz. I'm a senior planner with Civic Solutions. Uh, I have my master's in urban planning from SUNY Buffalo and received my American Institute of Certified Planners certification in 2019. Uh, I specialize in current planning and long range planning, including zoning code updates, housing element updates, and form based codes. Uh, as you know, I've been processing CDP applications and appeals for the city's planning department since 2021 for a variety of projects, uh, including public infrastructure projects and single family homes. So looking forward to continuing working with you uh, throughout this next year. Thank you, Adam. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Lily Rudolph. I'm with Brincon Consultants. I have 20 years of public sector and private consulting planning experience. And I specialize in current planning, housing element updates, coastal permitting, zoning ordinance amendments, and specific plan preparations. I've processed CDP applications for the city of Malibu for about six years, including dozens of single family residences, the Civic Center Way Improvements Projects, and the Paradise Cove Wastewater Treatment Facility. And I'm happy to be back. Thank you, um, Lily, and next slide, please. Good evening, Planning Commission. Uh, my name is Gabriel Salazar. I'm a senior contract planner with Civic Solutions. Um, I have been uh, helping out with the city of Malibu since this past uh, September of last year. And I have over 12 years of experience in local government, working in city planning, public policy, grants, and economic development. I'm a certified economic developer with the state of California. Um, I focus and work primarily on current planning and some advanced planning. I'll be uh, working there on administrative um, um, APRs and coastal development permits for the city of Malibu and look forward to continuing to work with staff and the applicants there. So thank you and, and grateful for this opportunity. Thank you, Gabriel. Next slide, please. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Marina Sack and I work for the city of Malibu planning department uh, from 2016 to 2019. And back then my primary role was to assist Wolsey fire victims to obtain building records, to distribute public notices, and overall the department records, converting hard copy records to digital. So currently I'm working as a submittal administrator, processing all incoming submittals to the planning department, including new and revised submittals and application materials. So I'm really happy to be back and help the department. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Next slide, please. Um, good evening, commissioners. My name is Akash Shah, and I'm associate planner with Four Leaf. I am an architect, urban designer, and a city planner with uh, seven years of experience, uh, mostly in urban design and city planning. Uh, prior positions include doing urban design projects back in Ohio and New York. As a contract planner with City of Malibu, I mostly work on the fire rebuild and recovery projects where I have approved more than 150 homes um, and look forward to work with planning department this year as well. Thank you. Thank you, Akash. Next slide, please. Uh, good evening, commissioners. I'm also having trouble with my videos, so I apologize for that. Um, maybe Alex can show a display photo. But uh, again, my name is Joseph Smith. I have uh, over 16 years of experience with uh, public and planning, uh, public and private sector planning, land use policy, real estate development, and managing planning departments. 
uh, before founding California Coastal Works, which is uh, my current firm, I was planning director for the city of Del Mar and department manager in development services for the Port of San Diego, along with a prior role in Malibu as a senior planner. So it's nice to see you all again. Uh, I am well versed in California's coastal regulations, CEQA, city zoning codes, and general plans with a master's degree in public policy from Pepperdine University. And I appreciate this opportunity to work with the city again. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Next slide, please. Hi, good evening, commissioners. Um, my name is Brenna Wingert. I'm with CSG Consultants. Um, I'm a senior planner. Um, I'm ASCP certified since 2020, um, and I bring over seven years of experience in the planning agency working with uh, municipalities in Los Angeles County, such as the Palos Verdes Estates and uh, City of El Segundo. Um, my focus has been on providing project management and current planning services, including environmental planning services, um, coastal and hillside development, and development of a Granicus website for the City of El Segundo Building and Safety Department. Um, uh, I look forward to working with the City of Malibu. It's going to be great. Thank you, Brenna. Next slide, please. Good evening. I'm Mary Wright. I'm a vice president with Civic Solutions, and I'm also a working planner. I provide current and long range planning services to a variety of cities in Southern California, and I've been working with Malibu off and on uh, since 2018. Prior to joining Civic Solutions, I was with the city of San Diego for over 20 years, um, last serving as the deputy planning director. I hold a bachelor's degree in geography and a master's degree in city planning from San Diego State University. And I look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you, Mary. And that concludes uh, item 1B, but what a good looking group. Great looking group. <clears throat> and welcome to all of you. And thank you for coming back to us, some of you coming here to be with us to help get us through a lot of things that we've been working to do um i'm very much appreciative and uh i tell by that smile on director malika's face he's pretty happy about all this himself so um to uh, vice chair Mazza, your hand is up yeah i have a couple questions um <clears throat> lily rudolph didn't post her phone number so uh i hope we can get that posted or we all saw it. <laughs> well, it wasn't on my screen. I'm kidding. Yeah, 10-4. Uh, and then several of the planners we know, uh, but uh, I just wondered if, and I don't know if we can do this by hand or not, but um, Ms. Weingart, uh, Akash Shaw, Marianne Sachs, Gabriel Salazar, Allison Cook, Nader Khalil, uh didn't give us a <clears throat> rundown on how much work they've done on local coastal cdp applications we have some that have done coastal exempt applications but i just wondered how many of those have experience with cdps <clears throat> about um those of you that do have experience in that area just raise your hands right now I think the majority of them do. Okay. I'll look at the tape later. Thank you. Uh, Vi Vice Chair uh, Maza, you've stumbled upon one of the difficulties we have with hiring. And that, that is the hardest thing is attracting folks to the city with coastal experience. And we've been fortunate that you know a good majority of this group we've been able to get some folks who used to work for us some new faces um, but when adrian and i go through the applications of uh, folks you know looking for permanent work with the city oftentimes it's folks with little to no experience in the coastal zone and so that's something we work very hard to try to find and uh, we feel really <laughs> grateful that folks like uh, you know Mary and, and Joyce and, and Lily and I'm not trying to take away from the group but and Joe Smith uh, and and Rick some of the return folks were really happy they've come back because you know they know the Malibu local coastal program and you know we look forward to growing the folks in the base that know that so that we can continue to find future help. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, since we've got that, I guess we can go to number two, which is oral, written and oral communications from the public. Rebecca, do we have anyone that wants to speak with us tonight? Yes, this evening. Um, well, first of all, let me let the contract planners know you are free to leave the meeting at this time. Oh, yes. And you then, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we do have Joe Drummond, uh, who has signed up in advance for public comment. If there are other members of the public present in the meeting who wish to speak under this item and have not already signed up to do so, please click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen while we hear from Joe Drummond. If anybody's leaving the meeting, I wanted to say welcome to everybody. So thank you and we'll see you later. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, Honorable Planning Commission, Happy New Year. I'm here about a few items. Uh, number one, I think um, you might have gotten a last minute photo from, from me through Rebecca this evening. I'd like to inform you that and ask your help regarding prior deals made to create view corridors in Malibu. In particular, at Big Rock and PCH, land was purchased there to create a view corridor when the person obviously blocked an ocean view from somewhere else along the coastline, the land was somehow donated to the MRCA, who in the past maintained the brush in the view corridor, but now refused to. How can we ensure these view corridors are maintained for ocean views and fire defense? How can these deals be enforced? Also, number two, I'd like to inform the city that I made a public records request back on December 19th to see some plans related to a permit from 2021. And I finally heard from Tracy Racine to call the city and make an appointment through extension 390 at the beginning of this year. I've called three times and responded to my public records request three times, telling them I received no response about making an appointment to come in. How can I contact the staff to make an appointment to see these public plans? It's ridiculous that no one has responded to me after almost a month of waiting and contacting the city over seven times now. So if you could please give some suggestions on how to enforce the view corridors donated to MRCA to maintain, as well as how to go about making appointments with certain city staff to see plans, that would be much appreciated. I do think that if the city makes these deals that aren't honored and can't get them to honor the view corridors, then they should maintain the view corridor. The city maybe can do it. It's not really a difficult thing to maintain these properties and someone needs to do it, preferably the owner of the property. So, thanks. Thank you, Joe. And uh, we also have Howard Rutsky who would like to take a moment to speak. Can I speak now? You yes, you may. may. First, uh, welcome to Skyler and uh, Nice to have you aboard. And second, to all the contract planners, a number of us citizens want to say thank you for signing on. And we're looking forward to getting the fire victims back in their homes and getting a lot of the backlog cleared out so we can get some more people that actually want to come here and live and build their homes and not take so long. So thank you. That's it. Thank you, Howard. And I am scrolling through, but I don't see any other raised hands at this time. So I see oh, Mr. Haney. Oh, yeah. do we? Okay. Oh, thank you. We needed one more scroll. Just a moment and I'll create a speaker identity for you. And Norm, you may go ahead. Uh, yes, can you hear me? We can. Uh, unmute. You no, we can. can. We can hear you, Norm. Correct? Yes, we can hear you. Um, let's see. Okay. All right, fine. Well, first of all, congratulations, Skylar, I think, <laughs> because I know being a planner or being on the planning commission is a lot of work. 
Um, and um, I want to state that I'm very happy to see Jeff uh, is back. I'm not sure for how long, but however long he is here, uh, he's a, a, a real valuable resource in the city of Malibu. Um, last but not least, uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually about a week and a half ago, I called uh, Richard Mullica. And he got back to me that, that afternoon and resolved uh, an issue which was very important to me <clears throat> in about five minutes. I had the same experience with, um, uh, with other planners in the city. Uh, Adrian Fernandez returned a phone call in one day uh, and returned another phone call the very same day. So I, I want to say that our planners are working as hard as they possibly can, and they are responsive to the public. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haney. Thank you, Norm. And that does conclude public comment. Okay, on to 2B, planning commission and staff comments and inquiries. I see Vice Chair Maza's hand up first. Okay, well, my hand was up basically to answer uh, one of Joe Drummond's questions. Uh, I negotiated that easement with uh, Morton, and so I can you can I can talk to you offline and explain all the rules and how it came about. Uh, Richard will have to, um, or somebody will have to comment on on how you get the brush cleared. I have nothing to do with that. Um, now, the other comment I want to talk about is our our access to data. Uh, our website allows us to see basically three years worth of stuff, and then we've then then it's just like real hard to find. And we all the time we review extensions that are the, the data on them is more than four, three years ago so in the past before we changed our um, website we had five years worth of data and it saved us tons and tons of time and i know since then the cost of database storage has gone down a hundredfold so i i really request that we save a lot of staff time and a lot of planning commissioners time by leaving that data available for people to look up rather than having to request staff reports from four years ago. That's it. Oh, and congratulations, Skylar and Jeff. Uh, Jeff and I are still going for the, the age, age out and we'll just keep going. And Skylar, you can age, age us all out. You can stay on for 30 years. Thanks a lot. Uh, Commissioner Hill. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the, the new planners. Welcome to the quote unquote new commissioners. Um, I'll first, yeah, I have a number of things. I, I'll just piggyback on what John just mentioned um, about basically talking about retaining records for some duration. That's something that should probably be reviewed under the uh, departmental efficiency review process that's going ahead. And al along with that, at the last council meeting, Ryan Embry raised a good concern about having PDFs be searchable. They should always be, sometimes they're not still. Um, and uh, relating, to, I, I, independently of John, I didn't know he was gonna talk about this. I, I looked up some past agendas and found they didn't go back very far um, and they, videos on YouTube, planning commission goes back four and a half years, council goes back a few months longer than that. It seems like video should be up there for, I don't know, 10 years or some duration that covers any of the past applications that we might need to refer to. Um, Norm, your mic is scratchy. I think you could probably get, get that fixed or a new one. Um, Joe, yeah, there's wild tobacco and fountain grass both uh, shouldn't be there down at that fence. 
I guess the question there is, does the city have any formal role as an intermediary between members of the public and the MRCA? Can, can we intercede there or is that really just for the public to uh, rattle MRCA's uh, uh, chain? Um, and then in the February minutes, there was a note that I had reached out to the Coastal Commission to request a presentation on the sea level rise. That's true. We had a little bit of back and forth. I don't know how much I had to do with it in the in the end, but um, they are holding a sea level rise stakeholder working group meeting on January 27th. Uh, it's a Friday, 9 to 3 p.m. We should all participate in that or at minimum watch the recording of it. I think that'll be helpful. Um, elsewise, I saw someone online say that the Planning Commission hasn't put any restrictions on the truckloads of sand coming for Broad Beach. So that made me wonder about whether we'll be hearing that or was that heard in the past or uh, whether that's coming up for us. Um, and then finally, I want to take a couple of minutes here to say something. It's, it's a short night here. We have a, a new term with some new people. And um, I've, so I think this is a good occasion to clarify how I think about our role here for the public generally and, and given that my approach sometimes seems incomprehensible to others in this chamber. Um, so personally, I aim to be what my best te teachers were, strict but fair. Strict not in the sense of being mean, but in reading the code rigorously. Fair in the sense that where the code doesn't speak, interpretation should be informed by precedent. The purpose of our work as many folks understand, we're not we're, we're here to check that the code has been applied correctly and make the findings or not, but there's more to it. Um, whereas the council is inherently a political body, our role differs in being quasi-judicial. Here, the more political a decision, the greater risk that it's been poorly made. So for instance, I don't discuss items with my appointing council member. Uh, I, I can say ever, I don't wanna swear to that, but I don't think that's ever happened. Um, and when the application of code to the facts isn't black and white and a commissioner has to rely on the judgment for which he or she was appointed, our fundamental job is to serve the public interest. That means two different things in the code. One, in uh, government code section 65101, it means what's good for the public. Planning commissioners shall act in the public interest. Two, it also means what the public is interested in. In section 605.103D, uh, it provides that in conjunction with the planning department, the commission shall, quote, endeavor to promote public interest in, comment on, and understanding of the general plan and regulations relating to it, meaning in our case, the LCP and the MMC. Um, and, in, and indeed, part of what I'm endeavoring to do right now is to promote that public interest and comment. We also have many other duties and obligations under state code, which are summarized on the websites of the League of California Cities and the Institute for Local Government. So in practice, what does good for the public mean? That's kind of what we're here about. In a development application, the applicant will obviously have a big stake in the project, but rarely the only stake. Maybe for several neighbors, there will be smaller but substantial stakes. And then there may be some small incremental stakes for each of maybe thousands of the members of the public. Those might be environmental impacts, traffic impacts, small impacts, but which may have cumulative effects. Some of which may be difficult to measure. So may be easy for us to miss or ignore. So our job is to appreciate that whole range of interests, private and public, weight them accordingly and try to achieve a balance. Now, applicants show up to represent their own interests. So it's the more diffuse public out there in the environment for which we have a particular duty of care to make sure those concerns are addressed. And finally, to be able to appreciate all those various interests and potential impacts, we have to be critical to ask tough questions. It's not about being critical in the sense of being negative, but in the sense of being discerning. Sometimes people don't distinguish those two, assuming that just to ask a tough question implies prejudice. But we can't just assume the staff has caught every issue, gotten everything right. We have to check the details, especially when staff has a high workload. Um, and so we're often the public's last set of eyes, unless they can afford the $750 appeal to counsel. So it's vital that when each commissioner looks at an item, he or she uses a magnifying glass 
figuratively and literally when you're looking at those tiny plants. And if in any, if and when any of us jumps to an immediate motion to approve or to deny without yet hearing other perspectives, that may be a sign that we're about to shortchange that public interest. So let's not be rushed, but instead take care of the, take the time to serve the public well, be deliberate in our deliberations, and stick to the tradies motto, do it once and do it right. We may save, save time in the long run for both staff and applicants. And those are my comments, thank you. Very good. Um, Commissioner Jennings. Uh, it's a hard act to follow, uh, I have no comment. <laughs> Newly appointed Commissioner Peak. Um, yeah, I just wanna say I'm looking forward to this this uh, role and uh, just want to thank all of the uh, my fellow commissioners for welcoming me to this role and thank all the staff um, at our city that are, you know, working for some of them, I guess, kind of around the clock to keep the public and our community and property owners um, as happy as they can. So hopefully, um, that work will continue. It was nice to meet all the newer contract planners and some older people that used to work at the city and that I got to used to work with. So I uh, I look forward to this role. And I think that, you know, just in commenting sort of a little bit on what Craig said, I think that everybody that's ever had one of these seats has their own take on how they're balancing those interests. And sometimes that's different for everyone, but I think that people always do a good job. So I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, um, I've got just a couple of things here. Can I, um, I'm sorry. Um, I do want to mention one thing. And I, I should have mentioned it earlier. Um, one of the um, one of the benefits, I guess, if you will, of uh, that the state affords to uh, people who uh, were burned out and in, in, in a federally deserve uh, federally declared disaster area is that um, when they rebuild their homes, they can uh, keep their old trended base value as a property tax term, the, the, the property tax basis that they had before for that portion of the home that they rebuilt that's comparable to what they lost. In other words, if they, if they build the same square footage that they had before, they get to the, have the old basis, not, the, not a reappraised basis at its fair market value uh, at the date of rebuilding. The, um, there's a lot of different sources for that, but the one source is, I think, uh, Revenue and Taxation 70.5, which basically puts a limit on the time within which you must rebuild in order to uh, take advantage of that benefit. And the, and the time limit is five years. Um, so we're coming on to that. Uh, looking at the website, the number of people who have actually been able to rebuild and get a COO uh, is not everybody. And and so um, I just wanna make sure that the staff and the public is aware of that potential problem. Now I have talked to uh, people from um, BBK about uh, possible alternatives. I was given a lead to uh, a, um, uh, I can't remember what it was now, whether it was a whether it was a statute or or an executive order, because I know that that during the COVID crisis, certain extensions were um, extensions were made to allow for the problems that COVID had created. Uh, but it's not clear to me yet as to whether or not that extension will apply to the five year limitation uh, imposed by uh, Revenue Taxation seventy point five. So. Um, I want to get that off my chest. I'm going to try to look into it further and we'll try to report back to you, but I think it's going to be a serious problem for people who are not able to com complete the rebuild uh, within the five-year time period. Thanks very much. Commissioner Peake. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Uh, just a question for Richard on that. Richard, has that been brought to the council's attention and maybe, I don't know, dealing with any lobbyists or anything to get some sort of extension related to that? It seems like that's more the direction that that should go. Make sure I'm not muted there. Uh, no, I don't believe it's been brought to the council's attention, but I have a meeting tomorrow with the city manager 
I can be certain to bring that up. So I will make a note of that. I think that Jeff is very spot on with making that, you know, the public aware of that. The council hopefully will bring that up. Um, and if you can discuss that with him, I think that's very much in our community's interest and that's going to have a, a big effect on a lot of people. Yes. Good call. Uh, Vice Chair Maza. Uh, this is a, a revenue code uh, for the stake. And um, I suggest we use our lobbyists. Uh, changing the state income tax code is a very, very hard thing to do. Um, and it usually takes what looks like longer than the time period in existence, and they usually are not retroactive. So to attack this, you have to go straight to the top, chairman of the Revenue and Taxation Subcommittee or whatever it is up in Sacramento. And we're pretty far away from Sacramento. And we're pretty peanut city. So uh, I think we need professional help. Uh, if I could, um, I, I I think that that well, it is a state law. Uh, it, it, the the local assessors uh, have a good deal of influence in how the law is applied and interpreted, along with the um, the Board of Equalization. So uh, I, I don't really look to. I don't think it would be possible to get a legislative solution to this. But I think that there well may be some lobbying that could be done at the Board of Equalization level and the, and and with our county assessor. Uh, who should be mindful of the fact that, that you know, I, I know the five-year limitation was put in because, you know, at the time the legislation was written, is who couldn't build their house in five years? Well, uh, maybe that that needs to be, uh, you know, brought home to them that, that maybe that it needs to be extended and it could be done. I think it could be done fairly informally by by the assessor and or, and or the Board of Equalization. Mr. Peake. Sorry, I had uh, one more comment um, in regards to the records and that stuff, and maybe Richard could shed a little bit of light on it, but um, doesn't most of the city's records all exist on on base going back a lot further than just four years? And maybe you were re referring more to some specific uh, um, agendas, minutes, videos. I don't, don't think the videos are on there, but I think that most of the planning records that were somebody was requesting or referencing are available on on base. Is that not correct? Yes, the in general um, documents, staff reports, resolutions, uh, those are on on base. Uh, some of the very old county files were still in the process of uh, scanning. Um, the one part of on base that, that the public doesn't have access to, however, are for the most part, our plans, um, the, the building and safety plans, and that's because of copyright issues. Uh, I would say that the majority of folks coming to City Hall to look at records these days are to look at plans, uh, since most everything else is online. And and I can follow up uh, with uh, Yolanda about the plans that uh, Ms. Drummond brought up uh, and see that somebody get, I'll, I'll ask a call, uh, come to her. Yeah, thank you. That That seems really not cool if she's having to make seven phone calls for something and it doesn't sound like maybe the right person is is hearing from her she's getting through to the right person so hopefully that can get taken care of in the next few days okay so i just got a couple of things when i wrote this stuff i was pretty hot to trot over a couple of different things one of them was the as our state goes to wants to go to full electric um and I'll get to you, Commissioner Hill, as soon as I'm done. Um, as our state wants to go to full electric, and we're no more ready for that than the man in the moon, you know, we, we still have balanced power. And during the summer, people weren't allowed to charge their electric cars because the grid couldn't handle it if you were running your air conditioning. So by saying that we're not going to have gas any longer because of the environment, I guess there's, I guess there's probably some good reason for that. Um, it's it's right now it's not we're, we're not even close to being there and we know how edison is with us they're they're not going to be our friend in this and they're they're just licking their chops for this to show up with no gas and full full edison 
this 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 really should be something so and as we all saw our gas bill went up because they can see what's coming in time so um i i just i just don't see how this is going to work as quick as they want i get it i'm all for it um it's what we've got for our kids and my grandkids it's in uh everything that goes with that so we'll we'll just we'll have to see how that goes my other thing is and as we talked about staff and director malika has got this brand new war chest that i'm was looking at there on the uh on the screen i think i want to give thanks to to the staff and i want to say what's really important is i believe that when contractors and architects come from out of town you should take the time to learn about our city we're not like anywhere else we have a building official as we call the building official not so much our director of building and safety but building official and yolanda bundy is that and a lot she is a lot for our city as all the people that work here are but yolanda's worked pretty hard to keep us keep us together and I would like to see people that come from out of town take a minute and watch your video that she did last year uh, on the code changes and those that come before our planners uh, Richard's people were the first people they get a hold of and they want to know about why the windows changed or why do I have to run the Tesla batteries or why do I have to do this and do that take take an hour and eight minutes and watch Yolanda's work now I know that took a lot longer than an hour and eight minutes to make and she got some help probably from Tracy or, you know, maybe, I don't know, a number of people, no doubt. But this this is very important. We, we've got people that come here and they just do stuff. And we are a city that is not building and safety run. We are more a planning city first. And while I think that there could be some loosening of those strings as time goes on, or if we, as, as Director Malika and, and uh, our building official are working together I think more and more and more to try and do these things with our over the counter things and people, you know, you know why people uh, bootleg stuff is because it takes a lifetime to do some of the most easiest things that really wouldn't be um, doesn't have to go through all the way to us. There, there's many times I believe, and I've seen it over the years that that doesn't have to happen, but, but all in all, we've got, I, I believe with, Director Malika having these people now, we have a new council. Um, we've got great people. We've got uh, a couple of new, well, we've got Jeff, of course. We have uh, Commissioner Peake now. I just think that out of town people need to take a look and see who we've got here. These are long-term people. I'm the new guy on the block at 14 years. And um, you just have to understand how we do things. We don't do it like anywhere else, and especially in Portugal, which I've heard somebody actually say to me, I didn't have to do that in Portugal. Well, okay, but you got to do it here. So um, that, that I think is very important that, that those that want to come here and work and we want you, we need you, we need your families, we need, we need these things to happen. Um, with that, uh, you know, we had the rain, uh, PCH, you know, I saw that they were, we actually had people out here fixing some potholes. That was great uh, from Caltrans. Uh, they didn't get everything, of course, all the way out here to the, the West End, but I guess hopefully they're here tomorrow to, to catch some of it. Um, you know, we've got that situation at the at the Trancas Bridge. The number two travel lane needs to be repaved. It's bad. It's a bad travel lane. And I'm hoping um, I, I need to send, and I probably officially should send something to Superintendent Hart on this and uh, Director uh, DeVoe on uh, getting that fixed. It's awful. And, uh, you know, also, the right turn lane down at the corner at Trancas, there's the, the hashed area, but it's wide enough and restriped enough for a car to make a right turn right there. So that should go with, with what I uh, I need to do. And, you know, back a little bit to our to our citizens, you know, we've got, we're going through a lot of stuff with a lot of people. One of our own commissioners is starting his year five and he doesn't have his home yet, not, not even starting his home yet. And... Um, we have, I, I believe we have a lot of people like that in this tax base thing that uh, Commissioner Jennings just brought up is very important. So when our citizens come in for certain things and they want to do, I, I, I'm, I know planning is doing the best they can because they're the first one to get them. And I know our, uh, our uh, building safety people are doing a great job. You know, Dee Raham and uh, Jasmine, she's here now and, 
and learning. We've got some good people up front. We're, we're doing the best we can. And um, also, and then, I, I'm, then I'll be done. You know, we, we, we had our last meeting last year on December 5th. For whatever reason, I was thinking we had one on the 17th. And I honestly believe we could have. And because we have so many people that are waiting for us, um, I think we need to add a couple of dates in there. And I think waiting, you know, an extra date on the 17th of, of um, December is not too late into the month. And I think because we do have a lot of people that need to get things done, we should we should be cognizant of that. Now, I don't know about maybe making an agenda item out of this and maybe finding a couple extra days. Obviously, it would be in December now and maybe January of next year that we don't have to wait quite as long into the month to get started. Um, or maybe uh, council has a meeting on a Monday, ours is on Tuesday, then we jump back into our rotation. But um, that's something I think it would be very important to do. It's, it's we can do that. It's not gonna take away from anything. So um, with that, uh, I think I'm done. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Hill. Yeah, to just quick about the past records. Um, one, on, on base still feels kind of spotty to me. Uh, I know that it's been re, been populated with old records over time. I hope that that project isn't done yet because it still does feel spotty. Um, and secondly, on the, the videos, going back four and a half years only, I know we have the videos that go back much further. It probably shouldn't be expensive to put them on, on YouTube because um, when you need to go back and look at a hearing, that's the record. The video is the record. And then as for what uh, Commissioner Smith just said, yeah, an extra day or two would be good. I think it probably depends on how quickly they get up to speed with the new planners and whether they they can fulfill some extra. I mean, I think we, we have days missing just because we haven't had a full workload yet in front of us. So thanks. Okay. Uh, Vice Chair Mazda, and then I want to go to Director Malika. Okay. Uh, first, I'm going to disagree with both you and Craig on extra days. We have meetings. We had a meeting that lasted an hour a couple months ago. Um, it's balance of workload. We we have meetings where we carry over three or four items, and we have other meetings where we go home at 7.30 or 8. And that's most important. If you put in the time you should put in, or a planning commission meeting, it's usually, in my case, 20, 30 hours, okay, if it's one of these loaded meetings. And eight days before Christmas, people tend to have relatives, things to do, okay? Uh, so I just want you to keep an eye on the fact that we do have a life, okay? And uh, and and nobody want to be on the planning commission if they never get a day off, Uh it's just my opinion. Now, I just want to uh, agree with you on gas. There's a big article in today's Wall Street Journal about how gas will be the next Tea Party fight, that people aren't going to go for it when you try to take their range away from them. Uh, but that's, it's more than that. It's taking your electric water and making you heat your water with electricity. If anybody's ever had an electric water heater, triple the bill. Uh, and it's the fact that the state has shut off gas. We only have one pipeline coming in. Earlier this month, believe it or not, we were paying $70 a, a MMCF. And the rest of the country was paying $4.95. That's how screwed up it is. And I don't see ourselves coming up with a budget of trillions to fix the, the grid, the grid in Malibu. I was told by an electrical engineer if the average street had six Teslas on it and they all plugged in at night, they blow the transformers. So uh, you're right. We'll see what the politics of it is. But uh, banning gas appliances in seven years is nuts. And anybody who's over say 50 remembers medallion homes in the 50s when general <laughs> electric paid off the con the home builders to put in free appliances as long as they were all electric uh and then they had to rip them all out 
10 years later when people figured out it cost twice as much to live in those houses. So, <laughs> got it right. Good point. Uh, Director Malika. Take down my hand here. Thank you. Uh, good evening, commissioners and chair. I just want to take a minute to introduce Monica Castillo. Hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, Monica will be stepping in tonight uh, for Pat Donegan. Uh, Pat and Trevor both had scheduled meetings, uh, Pat with Hermosa, Trevor with Lomita. So uh, Monica, we really appreciate it, stepped in and she will be with you this evening. Uh, so please feel free to reach out to her with any questions. Yes, um, thank you, um, Chair and Commissioners. Just briefly, um, I've been in the municipal law sector um, since 2014. I started with the City of LA as an in-house Deputy City Attorney in the Land Use Division. Um, I advised the Building and Safety Commissioners um, for three years and attended their public meetings. Um, I did mostly... Um, well, I did 50-50 litigation advising, um, and um, before that, I was um, in the private sector working for a big law firm representing uh, corporate clients um, in general litigation. And then now I've been with Best Best and Krieger uh, for almost four years now, and I'm currently the city attorney in Santa Paula, and um, I've done some uh, work for Malibu here and there behind the scenes. And I'm very happy to be here tonight and look forward to um, being of assistance in any way I can. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. I think we've got everybody through that. Um, we have the consent calendar on 3A and Previously discussed items, we have none. So 3B on new items, we have approval of the minutes. I move we approve the minutes. I'll second it. Do we have a roll That's call? All four minutes. Do we have to do one at a time? You mean okay. at each date separately? During... Yes. Oh. Excuse I... me. Do you want to um pool any of the items from the consent calendar so you can vote I do. on that I, I do and we well, also have a member of the public who would like to speak in opposition to item 3b2 uh, okay so it's Paul yes okay. I, I think the, there's a little confusion I think what Monica was asking was whether we wanted to pull uh any other items from the consent calendar we can do this with one motion just to approve item uh, the staff recommendation on item uh, 3B1. Yeah, my only point was we, we just had 3B2 pulled. Yeah, and 3B2 pulled. But we can do 3B, we can do 3B1. It's not critical as to what order we do it in. We just get it out of the way. Yeah, so I'm making a motion. My question is, do I make four motions or one motion? There's four different meetings. I think it's because it's... Go ahead, Monica. I don't mean it. Oh, you... Um, so since it's only two items, you can, um, pull, move to pull item B2. You're not only allowed to, but you also have a public comment. So you're required to, um, and, um, and then move to approve item B2. Okay. I, I believe what he was asking is, uh, Item 3B1 is a set of four meetings worth of minutes, which I believe can be approved in one motion. Oh, I see. There are four sets of minutes. Okay. Yeah, no, my, I was, the only reason I asked is we, we have to vote on those. Yes. I, I wondered if you could vote on four at once. Or yes, you can. What happens if one of, somebody says, no, I vote no on number two? Uh, how, do you put, how do you do that? Then um, they would... Um, amend the motion to um, move to amend the motion to make the change that they're objecting to. Okay. Okay. I may, I move that we approve the minutes of May 20th, May, July, 20, May 20th, 1921, uh, 2021, July 22nd, 
2021, January 18th, 2022, and February 2nd, 2022. Oh, second. Vice Chair Mazza? Yeah. Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Commissioner Peak? I'm going to abstain because I was not at any of those meetings. And Chair Smith? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, and do I, I, I suppose I have to make a motion to pull item two. No, uh, it's, just, it, it's been pulled. It's well, just pulled. So we're, we're good to go. Good to go on it now. Okay. Item 3B2, administrative coastal development permit number 19-022 and minor modification number 22-002, an application to demolish an existing barn and construction of a new barn, detached second unit, and a 400 square foot detached garage, grading and associated development, including a minor modification of up to 50% reduction on the front yard setback. And we have senior planner Brooks here, and she has the staff report. I do. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, um, Chair Smith. I think I do have a presentation, Alex, if you could um, upload that a brief um, presentation. I'm not seeing one for this item. I'm seeing one for your later item. Did you upload two? I did. Is Can it? you email me the one for this very quickly? Sure. Sorry. Chair Smith? Yes. As a point of order on this, I think the only question in front of us at the moment is, do we uh, receive and file or do we call for a full CDP? I don't know whether that requires a full staff report on the item or not. I mean, I guess if we're gonna talk about the reasons why it would need a full CDP, and we're gonna hear from the public, presumably about that. Um, I think that changes everything, right? When you yeah, it, to receive and file. Yeah. So I, I, I just, I don't know how much we need to hear or not is my question, I guess. Um, I'd be happy here. to do a quick oral presentation. I mean, if it just basically has, um, yeah, basic slides with the aerial map and project description, all of which are in the notice of decision. We can skip the PowerPoint. I could just do a brief presentation. Um, this item is an administrative coastal permit that was approved by the planning director on January 10th of this year. Um, the property is in a regularly shaped um, lot with an existing single family residence and accessory equestrian uses on the property. Um, the property totals about four acres in size. Let's see, um, the minor modification request is to allow the detached garage um, to encroach in the front yard setback. Um, this minor modification is consistent with that which was approved for the existing residents. Um, to date, staff has received correspondence from the public regarding concerns about drainage um, on the site. Um, there was a concern about um, the runoff or potential runoff from the waste from the equestrian uses. Um, the project is conditioned um, to provide a water, I think it's a water quality mitigation plan. Um, which is something that is required for all CDPs that include um, for properties that, that have confined animals on the site. Um, it has been the city's practice to condition that mitigation plan to be reviewed during the plan check process. Um, that concludes my brief presentation. I'd be happy to ask, uh, answer any questions. Okay. Um... You want to hear from the public first? Yes, I think we I think we have to do that. For disclosures, uh, please. Disclosures. Oh, disclosures. Uh, Commissioner Jennings. Okay. Nothing about um as to this this particular aspect of this project, although it's one of my favorite pieces of property uh in the city because it's something that's come back in front of me in one way or another over the last, oh, I'd say maybe 20 years. Um 
And it's one of my favorites because um, it, there was a huge battle over um, over the existence or uh, alleged existence of a wetland in the property. Um, uh, a battle that went up at least to the Coastal Commission. I think it went to court after that. It turned out that the wetland was the result of uh, a neighbor having a broken sprinkler valve and uh, drained a bunch of water into the area. And, and uh, so it's just it, it's just a wonderful piece of property. It's been a source of, of, uh, of dispute and disruption for at least 20 years, as I say. Interesting. Um... Okay. Uh, I think uh, we're going around um, yeah, saying okay. whether there's a disclosure of that. Right. Okay. Commissioner Hill. Well, I none other than that. I had some email with Richard Malika about uh, interpretation of the code section that exempts certain things as uh, administrative. We'll okay. get into that. Vice Chair Maza. Uh, I like Jeff. We're, we've been through the through the mill on this one. Uh, many many meetings, but they aren't totally apropos to this particular meeting. Uh, I did uh, ask Renika for clarification on uh, prior grading, which I will be asking about, and um, the actual exemption itself but i i got and i got an email back at around five o'clock so i'm sort of skimmed it but that's the way it goes okay our commissioner peak um i received i had a brief phone call with richard uh, about this uh, i didn't learn anything that wasn't in the staff report and i had a brief call um from uh, Chris Deluich, Schmitz and Associates, who is working on this project, and I didn't learn anything that's not in the staff report. That's it. Okay, I uh, I haven't gotten anything uh, either. Um, okay, so let me see if I'm going to get this right. We're going to listen to the public, let them speak, and then I guess we come back to us. Well, actually, um, we'll begin with opening a microphone for Chris Delu from the applicant team. Cheryl Smith is also available to respond to questions. And Chris, could you please clarify whether you would like to provide some initial comments or reserve the full 15 minutes for a rebuttal to public comment in opposition? Chair, Chair Smith. Go ahead. Uh, Oh, sure. and we're I don't... just we're just we're not holding a hearing tonight. Um, so staff reports, 15 minutes, all this kind of stuff should not apply. That's the reason I was just asking. I, I appreciate that. I, I believe uh that we have a receive and file, and that's where it is, and that's where it goes. We're we don't really have anything we're gonna talk about, um, unless you felt like you had to talk about it, and then we'd we'd have to change that and we'd have to take Somebody have to take a vote and see if you can get your, you know, the votes to to do that. But right now, uh, my feeling is, it's a receive and file, and we and we go on to the next item. Well, we do have speaker public speakers in opposition, which was the reason for pulling the item. Okay, but they they uh, and and we'll have to ask Monica. But what we've done in the past is three minutes for public comment on consent on consent items, not a full hearing. In fact, we've been cautioned by by, by uh, uh, Trevor not to have a full hearing on the consent item. Right. We're not doing a, a public hearing tonight. We are uh, to receive and file. Uh, you have a, I believe it's two public comments, and each of those um, speakers are entitled to comment on whatever is on the agenda. Um, and so they each get three minutes. Okay. Okay, um, so I believe Chris might be signed in as Diana Springer. If you could unmute that that person. I, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. And would you like to speak initially, or would you like to reserve for a rebuttal? I would like to reserve for a rebuttal if I can. Okay. Then our first speaker will be Joe Drummond. Point of order. Yes. There is no rebuttal. 
this is not a hearing. Would we have typically allowed the applicant team to decide whether they would like to speak before or after hearing what members of the public who oppose the development have to say? Okay, well, when you say rebuttal, we usually say you speak and then you, you rebut what other people say. You're saying they get to speak last. They don't, do not have a rebuttal. But okay. that's picking, picking flies off the table. I mean, I can speak for three seconds and then reserve the remainder of my three minutes for rebuttal. So. I, I think what's going on here is that we don't need, that nobody wants to have any rebuttal, that that's not the way that this should work out. But yeah. what I'm gathering is that whether he speaks first or he speaks second, we can, any one of us can call him back if we have a question. Is that correct? Okay. Yes, yes you are correct, uh, Member Peak. And uh, Rebecca, I think just like any other meeting, if it's the chair's wishes, the speakers can go in some sort of order if they request. It's uh, up to the chair, like it would be up to the mayor at a council meeting. And what is your preference, uh, Chair Smith? Well, I get we need to hear from the public, so let's hear from let's hear from them, and then we'll come back. And I believe it's a receive and file, and we're done. Okay, if you could please unmute for Joe Drummond. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm the reason I pulled this. I I got word of this project that it's, I guess, trying to slip by as a simple ACDP rather than a CDP. So they're doing a demolition of a full structure and rebuilding, as well as building a completely detached second unit. So the property apparently already had substantial development back in 2019. Like it looks like there's a huge, I don't know, I, I would have been helpful to see the, the over view of the property because I'm not sure if that huge structure across the street is part of this property or not um i just i just i'm wondering if it's insulting to little projects and like for like rebuilds to have to jump through so many hoops and a huge project by a big developer tries to slip through so easily how can this qualify to be an administrative decision if lip 13.13.1 requires a cdp when there's demolition the planning this it states the plan director may process administrative permits if the project is for any of the uses specified including any development of four dwelling units or less that does not require demolition and there are four dwelling units or less in this project so it does require and it does require demolition so a full cdp should be required and then there's also another clause that says that it can only be administrative if development is not in excess of a hundred thousand dollars and looking at that property it looks like it's going to be much more than that and i don't know where the habitable habitable dwelling is on the property because it doesn't seem to have a main house i don't I, I can't seem to see it but if there is one you can point it out but how so how can an adu be an adu when there's when it appears to be the only habitable habitable dwelling habitable that's what i'm trying to say sorry dwelling on the property um i would think that a main house has to be in the vicinity in order to allow an adu I, and I do, again, see this huge complex across the street from the project. So maybe this is the main structure. Was this the development in 2019? I'm not sure. What is it? A, is it a stables? What is that? Um, and there's also apparently a past grading issue with the property and that horse manure and other excrement is properly disposed of is, is important as there's a lack of drainage apparently on the property. Has this been checked out? And so I'm just wondering if it is supposed to be a full CDP rather than ACDP. That's all. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. The next speaker would be Pat Healy. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate um, Skylar on becoming a planning commissioner. It's nice to be able to see you again and, um, as part of the city. Um, honorable commissioners, um, there was a water course that once drained above ground and through 59 Bonzel and the other parcels that are under the same ownership as, far as, as, as Bonzel. Um, commissioner Jennings thought it was a leaky sprinkler 
but that's not the case. The water course was very clear and the Coastal Commission made a determination there was a water course that ran through this property. Um, the owner of these parcels put in extensive underground drainage improvements to ensure that the water course didn't, doesn't drain above ground on all or some of his many parcels. Once leaving the owner's property, the water get, course again drains above ground into Zuma Creek. Now, I don't know the location of the underground drainage system, but want to be assured of two things to preserve the water quality of the water course. One, that the horse manure and urine from the horses on site and in the new barn in no way drains into the underground drainage improvements. Public Works has to study this to make sure the condition 50 is effective. Uh, number two, the septic location for the alternative dwelling unit has to be set back at least 100 feet from the water course, whether it drains above or below ground. And those are my comments, and I just want to be sure if it does have to go to a CDP that these things are covered. Otherwise, um, Renika was kind enough to find tell me the person in Public Works that I can work with. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. Our next speaker will be Chris Stilu, who is identified as Diana Springer in the meeting, Alex. <laughs> okay, guys, I, can I get video too? No, I can't get video? No, you cannot. Okay, well, at least I can see your pretty faces. So, this is uh, Chris Delo from Schmitz and Associates representing uh, 5900 Bongo Canyon Road, LLC, the owner of the property and the applicant. Uh, I guess I'd like to start first with um, Pat's statements regarding the water course. Um, I think Pat is referring back to uh, questions that the Coast Commission had back in 2005 or so about the, the drainage feature, quote unquote, that was on the property. That matter has been litigated and relitigated, both figuratively and literally over the last 15 years. Uh, there was litigation, it, and it did find that the overwatering of those properties to the north, along with leaks in the plumbing, were causing drainage to come onto our client's property and flow across it. Uh, the Coastal Commission Executive Director, Jack Ainsworth, did determine definitively, and he sent a letter into the city, which I forwarded to Planner, uh, Planner Brooks. Uh, and that letter uh, states that the commission does not assert jurisdiction over the property as appealable. There is not a stream or a wetland on the property. And that matter has been dispersed, uh, dispersed with back when we permitted the wastewater system for the property before the house was even built, the new house. Um, the, uh, the house that was built, uh, permitted in 19 and, and is built and is almost uh, done with construction. The issue was raised during that hearing, and it was addressed once again. Um, the same letter from Director Ainsworth was provided, along with biologist reports from Glenn Lucos and others, uh, demonstrating conclusively there is no wetland or stream on the site. Neither has the client attempted to hide or obfuscate uh, through any improved drainage devices, uh, a wetland in fact or otherwise. So there are no ESHA wetlands, streams, or other sensitive resources on site. Um, with regard to the, uh, the ag, uh, we do we do have a condition requiring us to do a WQMP ag, which uh, which has already been implemented on the property. There's an existing barn. This is an equestrian property. Uh, there already is a septic tank that has been used that has been used for treatment, and all wastewater uh, in, the, in the horse areas is being directed to that system for treatment, and we were going to continue to use that system with the new barn. That issue has been addressed in condition and in use. Um, the last item is whether or not the administrative CDP is properly being processed as an ACDP. I can tell you it is under the 13.13 uh, of the CD of the uh, LCP. Uh, second units or ADUs are specifically required to be processed administratively, as are any brand new house. You could you could permit a brand new 10,000 square foot house as an ACDP, and it's completely legitimate. So 
These are the kind of products we should be processing in three to four months, not three to four years. This one's already been three to four years into the mix. Okay, we we just Thanks. let's do the right thing and get this get this taken care of tonight, please. The applicant appreciates it. Thank you, Chris, and you are at time. Okay, back to us. Um, this is a receive and file uh, because of public comment. I believe that we had to move forward, and I'm. I don't believe there's any discussion. I believe we just move forward. Am I not correct in that, Ms. Castillo? So the commission may vote to receive and file or by majority vote um, call for a full CDP. And we also are allowed to comment uh, on the item before we vote. If you are putting a motion in front to vote on this, I guess that would be the case. Otherwise, I feel that we're this conversation is completed with this project and we're going to okay, go on. I to move to deny the project and move it to a CDP because it does not qualify under Section 1313 or 1328 in the staff report, which claims to follow the interpretation of LCP number 13.41 which is directly opposite to what the findings were. And I can read the uh, section 1313 uh, that, that the planning department claims makes it a, a, a CDP. And that, that says the planning director may process administrative permits if one, the proposed project is appealable as defined under chapter two. It is not, okay? So that's okay. The project is for any use, A, improvements to an existing structure. I see no improvements to an existing structure, none, okay? Uh, it's a new guest house, it's a new barn. That's not an existing structure. Once you tear it down, it's not existing, okay? Two, any single family dwelling, okay? This is not a single family dwelling. Okay. It's an ancillary unit. Lot mergers, not appropriate, not called. Any development of four dwellings or less that uh, do not exceed $100,000. We got two contractors on the Planning Commission. Can you build a guest house and a 1,458 square foot garage for 100 grand? in Mojave, let alone Malibu. You can't. So that it is over a hundred thousand dollar project. Now I uh, asked for clarification on that and I was told, oh, it's because it's defined that way. Well, improvements to a single family residence is defined under 13.41 as any improvement of an existing single family residence, except as noted below. For the purpose of this section, the term improvements to an existing single family dwelling include all fixtures and structures directly attached to the residence. None are, okay? And those structurally normally associated with a single family residence, such as garages, swimming pools, fences, storage sheds, and landscaping. And this is the important thing, but specifically not including guest houses or, ex or accessory self-contained uh, units. We're approving, uh, this is a consent item to put in a accessory dwelling unit. It does not fit under the definition. It will not stand up to an appeal. It's a violation of the LCP. It's clear as bell. It's 13.4.1. Okay, so Vice Chair Mazza, do you, so you want, to make, you want to make a motion for this and see if you can get the vote? That's his motion. motion. I want to uh, point out a couple other things. Uh, we this, this other project on the land was apparently finished within months ago. It may not even be finished. I couldn't find no record on it. Okay. So this is this is either 
disallowed because you have two CDPs at once, or it's serial development. And the staff report also does not include grading on the prior project, which in a memo I got today said there was none. Okay, well, if you look at the staff report, you look at the picture on whatever page it is, uh, on page 2 of 22, the whole lot has been graded. There's no grass, there's no foliage down there, the whole lot. And there's no evidence that there wasn't any other grade. There wasn't any prior grading. And so we've got a project that flat out needs a CDP. Under the And we talked earlier about following what the law says in the Coastal Act. And this is exactly what the Coastal Act, I read you directly from the Coastal Act. Excuse me, Chair Smith. Um, we have a motion that has not been seconded. Um, so we don't have an active motion on the floor yet. I'm, I'm seconding the motion and I have more discussion to add, but I'll let John continue. Well, uh, I continue with your discussion. Uh, this is a receive and file item, so we can't spend a huge amount of time on the particular project itself. I'm making the motion on mainly on the, the lack of proper procedure. Oh, okay, I guess I, I have the floor then. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can look at this and different things we can argue about, but I feel like right at the top, right at the front, and maybe this is a question to answer definitively before we even get into the other arguments, Richard uh, or Bernica, that $100,000 limit, when we look at the what 13.13.1 says the planning director may process administrative permits for there's the developments not in excess of $100,000. Note, John made some suggestion that that was connected to how many dwelling units there may or may not be there. Actually, the code section has a comma in it that was left out of the code when uh, presented in the staff report. It's, it's a different clause. So whatever the criteria, the development has to be $100,000 or less to be administrative. Now we can go on and argue about all the other stuff, but I, Richard, I or or Renika, I would like to hear how how the interpretation gets around that. I, I don't believe it's an interpretation uh, as to the intent of the code. We do have to follow the published letter of the law. Um, you know, it, it 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 it's not appropriate for us to say. I I know what they were thinking when they passed that law. Um, this is what it really means. We, we have to to stick with the law, in there. And the city's practice has been to look at that section as talking about basically developments of four or less. And typically, if there's four developments on a property, that that's multifamily developments, not single family. And the reasoning behind the, the past practice we've had is that when you look at the subsections above, um, if you were to read the, that section of the code in that method, it would um, it basically render the sections about approving a single family residence, because I think we can all agree it's going to cost more than $100,000 to build a single family residence. Uh, it would render that section of the code superfluous, as well as the improvements. And it's not something that has to meet all of those categories. You you just have to fit into one. And lastly, I, I, I do advise the commission, please do consider section B uh, after those, which has a carve out for the processing of ADUs. Uh, because uh, as you know, we, we're working on an ADU ordinance and the practice that the city has implemented to remain consistent with the state's laws are to process an administrative coastal development permit for uh, accessory dwelling units, second units, and, and that's for a matter of consistency with state law, and that's carve out section B uh, in 1313.1. 
Okay. I, um, two things. One, I, I think the hundred thousand dollar limit is separable because of that comma. Secondly, you, in email, you, you suggested to me that interpreting number four on that list, uh, would be, would make numbers one and two superfluous, but I don't see it that way. It seems, it seems to suggest that, um, <laughs> it implies that improvements or a single dwelling, single family dwelling could be administrative, even if they required demolition. So this is saying basically, yeah, if you've got to, if you just got a single house, even if it's demolition, it's administrative. But once you get demolition in the mix, then uh, it's four or less, this is less than four, then it, it's a CDP, not an ACDP. Uh, also, a way to another way to read that is that um, it suggests that if you had more than four units, then you would clearly need a CDP, whether or not there is demolition. So I think that's probably true. Yeah, right. So um, I I don't see how you get out of that, and and I think this is material in the end because we we have open questions about what the drainage is or isn't, and I I personally had a question about the total cumulative grading, uh, non-exempt grading, because we haven't really seen what the prior grading is. So to me, this just this is is um, it's fudging it too far to say, well, we've interpreted a certain way when, when to me, the, the, the $100,000 limit is really clear here. Okay, so do you feel like, but, <clears throat> go ahead, Commissioner Peak. I just had a question on just kind of clarifying that is, <laughs> and I just want to be clear that I mean, I do work in construction. I have a background in that. I don't know of any 900 square foot thing that's getting built in this city that's costing less than $100,000. I'm just saying that off the, I, I've been doing this a long time and I don't think that that, I mean, you could be building something out of a container and you're gonna spend more than $100,000. So I don't, I just, I just, my question for Richard is, is that like a make or break thing with this? Is there, or is it, is the, or maybe even this is a question for Jeff, or is the intention here that if there's a project that's costing more than a hundred thousand dollars, that it has to go through a full CDP? Go ahead. If Jeff. that's the case, then, I mean, you might as well wipe administrative plans off for any one of these. Right. That's, and I, Am I muted? No. I, I think that's the point. When you try to do statutory interpretation, the basic rule is you have to try to make all of the provisions of the statute work together and not contradict each other. And so in this particular situation, since you can build a, any single family dwelling under an ACDP, million dollars, $2 million, $20 million, whatever you want, it can be done by an ACDP to say that, well, okay, now if you got some demolition and it's got to cost more than $100,000, well, then it's off the board. It just makes no sense. The, the two have to be have to be looked at so that they work consistently with each other. As far as, as, as uh, John's point was, the reading back from the other section, I think what's confusing there is that John was reading from the earlier sections in section 13, which talk about exempt projects, projects which require no ACDP, no CDP, no nothing. They're exempt. They don't require anything other than an administrative plan review. You can shake your head all you want, John, but, but that's all that that section talks about is whether or not it requires any kind of coastal development permit. In this particular situation, if you if you look at at thirteen thirteen one, and and try to interpret it, you and 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 add in section B of thirteen thirteen one, which says yeah, if it's if it's if we're looking at us at a at a guest house, it's got to be done on our day CDP. I, I I I just don't see how I mean, other than an attempt to really. Uh, uh, make sure that nothing gets done under an ACDP. 
it just doesn't seem to me that they'd be that that's an interpretation that makes any sense at all. Mr. Chair. Go ahead. I read directly from our staff report, page two of two, why staff is saying this can be an ACDP. I read the requirements exactly as they're written by our staff. Okay. And I questioned it. I got a email back from Richard saying, well, it's a house. Well, it's not. Okay. And, and the staff, and it says, and then I read back in the code, what defines 13.313, and it's 13.41. It's specifically mentioned when you read the LCP. And it says, specifically not including guest houses or access, accessory self-contained residential units. Specifically. It's very yes, it, it, it does. And if you look at the heading, John, it says exemptions from and the de minimis waivers of coastal development permits, right? It's listing a series of things which do not require coastal development permits. It, it excludes second units or, or guest houses or whatever you want to call it, but that's picked up under 13.131B, which says, yeah, you got to do guest houses under, under administrative CDP. This is the definition, this is the section that defines what 1313 is. That's specifically what it is, okay? It's also specific $100,000. And you can't go away from that by saying, well, we couldn't do this if we followed that. That's not why they write codes. They go pick the one you don't like and get rid of it because we couldn't do the other stuff. That's just not the way it works. Now, when Richard answers, oh, we're doing ADUs all day long, Skyler just, you know, was on city council. Never once has the city council passed an ADU ordinance. We have direct legal opinions from our law firm that the letter from the Coastal Commission saying you are not covered by the ADU Act, uh, we are the jurisdiction. We recommend you approve them by doing a ordinance. The city council has never even considered an ordinance. They sent it back to us when we asked for information. They took a year to do it, but they never considered an ADU ordinance, ever. You're, you're, you're entirely right, so, John, it, but, the, but the ability to do a guest house is included in the LCP. And it is specifically excluded from being administrative. Okay. No, it is not. If you look at 13.13.1b, it is specifically required to be administrated. This says, unless it says, let's see here. Uh, it's not an improvement to an existing structure. Number one. Okay. There is no existing structure. It's new, 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 brand new both structures, okay? And it's not just a guest house, a two-bedroom guest house that costs 100000 It's a 1,458-square-foot fancy garage. I mean, a uh, 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 barn, okay? You can't buy a tough shed for that, that size. You can't buy a butler building for that size. It's just not possible. And then it says specifically excludes Accessory drawing units. Now, the city right now today, this very day, is in litigation on appeal of the fact that we don't have an ADU ordinance, okay? <clears throat> the, the plaintiff won on round one, and it's in appeal. The city itself is paying BBK buku bucks to say this is not true. We don't have an ADU ordinance. I don't I don't disagree with you. Well so so how can we say, oh gee, let's just do it because they couldn't build their ADU uh, uh, John John without re leaving off some of this stuff. Read, it, it, and and the purpose of the planning commission is not to determine how to get around the written language of the Coastal Act. 
Okay, John, not let, to, me, let me ask you a question. Not favor. to have staff assume that they can come up with a a ordinance that doesn't exist. There let me ask you a, no let me ask a favor. Ordinance. Just let me read some language to you, okay? This is 1313.1b. Notwithstanding any other provisions of the LCP, attached or detached second dwelling units shall be processed as administrative permits, except that the approval of such permits shall be appealable to the Coastal Commission if the project is located in the appealable zone. How do you interpret that? I interpret that as, as counter to 13.4.1, which they define as the, the, the way to interpret whether it's a, a house or an ADU. Okay, and ADUs are specifically not allowed. And I also do not say, oh, gee, you got that one, but you can cheat on $100,000, okay? Or you can cheat on the fact that it's not attached, not attached. There's not one stick of lumber on that house, on that property that's attached to that building, okay? That, that house that is built, not one nail, nothing. Okay. Notwithstanding any other provisions of the LCP, attached or detached second dwelling units shall be processed as administrative permits. Not barns. Dot, dot, dot. Now, and they also say, say you can, you can exclude a shed. A shed is not, as they say, it says associated with single family was such as garages, swimming pools, fences, storage sheds, and landscaping, but specifically not including houses, but it says resident commonly associated with a single family house. How many houses are in the coastal zone? What, a million? How many of them do you think have a barn? Do you think there's a, a barn in Laguna Beach? Do you think there's a barn in Newport Beach? Do you think there's one in, in, in virtually any Coastal city south okay. of us. Okay, John, no, no. you're 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 arguing that a barn should not be exempt from the requirement of obtaining a coastal development permit, either an ACDP or a full CDP. I'm saying I agree with several you. Items. I, we, we could argue about that. I think that a barn falls within that exempt provision. But in this case, an ACDP has been issued for the barn. It's not under that exempt provision at all. It has nothing to do with it. They say an ACB CDP can be issued if it's associated with a house as a normal use. It's not a normal use to have a 1,450 square foot barn on your house in okay. Costa Mesa, Newport Beach, Laguna Beach, Long Beach. But we're not in those zones. We're in Malibu where it is a use. What? John, John, not in those areas. We've been on the coast for 15 here. years or so together, and I, I never convinced you of anything. So. Okay, here's where, I, here's where I stand right now. I feel like if you guys feel that strong enough about what you're talking about, we need to take a roll call right now. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. I'm not. We have a uh, motion and we have a second. Dennis? Commissioner Peak. I do have a question for Richard. Oh, yeah. Sort of very specific. Historically, when a project like this comes forward, is that done administratively or not? Yes, it has been done administratively. A okay. barn. A, a barn and a guest house on one plan. I know normally you would like it to all come as one, but mm -hmm. in this case, it's not. It's coming separately after the house is done. And nor if my neighbor who just built their house, wanted to add one of these on, it would be normally done administratively. That's correct. If it, yes, if because since we are outside of the appeal jurisdiction. Okay. Thank okay. you. I, I still had some discussion that we didn't get to yet, which I, one, answering C Commissioner Jennings' concern there, yes, this is a second unit, but that A or Section B applies only to that. It doesn't necessarily apply to when we have that and other items in the same bundle here, including the demolition. And I guess one question that might be important here, is there a certific certificate of occupancy on the first permit? Is that still open or is that is that closed already? 
the building permits for the primary residence were finaled in November of 2020. I think I included that in your in the NLD. Yes. For and is project. there is there a certificate of occupancy? Because we we've had discussion in the past about whether something exists or not, and it's come down to a question of is there a COO? Um, I can check on base real quick while we're while you um, are deliberating. Let's see. I mean, I want, to make a, I want to make another point while you're looking that up, and that is we discussed how many hearings we're having and everything else, and we we also discussed earlier in the meeting following the code. Now, it isn't necessarily true that just because you can't appeal it to the city to the coastal commission doesn't make it. following the Coastal Act. And it also does not keep it from being appealed to the city council. And then what's happened to us as a planning commission is we try to slide these things through and then it goes to the city council and they don't want to deal with it. So they send it back to us and say, do it over again. We write another staff report. Then it goes appeal to city council again. This is what happened to this project that took years of uh, back and forth on what's the real rules and where's the trail for the horses that used to be there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And goes to court and all this kind of stuff over the fact that we, we don't have a hearing. And uh, and we we get these explanations that, well, they couldn't build it if they didn't interpret it this way. Well, that's not the way it's supposed to work. Is this over $100,000? Was there any demolition? Was there excess grading? Is the horse facility, now that they're building a big barn, is the waste storage proper? We don't have anything at all on that. Uh, you know, it goes on and on and on. This is, this is Bonzel Creek, okay? It goes right into the ocean. There's a lot of considerations here. And we can't just say, well, let's get this one done. So let's interpret it this way. We do not have an ADU law. We cannot, we cannot give an ADU. We don't have one. We don't okay, have an ordinance. Okay, Vice Chair, you you you've got your point. Uh Senior Planner Brooks, do you have you're muted? I'm still looking in on base now. My my laptop's kind of slow. Well, I could add too that in this phase of the project, we're looking at 530 cubic yards of grading. And I went on on base to see what the prior grading amount had been of any sort, non-exempt or whatever. And I did not find any anything in on base. So I did find the final grading plan and the final grading permit for the existing residents. Um, there was no non-exempt grading proposed um, or approved with the res with the primary residents. All of the grading that occurred was exempt grading. Is that the plan you sent to me today? Yeah, I sent you a copy of the there final approved. There's not one single number on that that says how much grading was done at all. It's the cover a plan page for grading. The but cover it, page of the grading plan has the grading table that was approved, and it included the different cubic yardage for different grading categories. The first sheet of that grading plan did include. I, I looked. Yardage. I didn't see it, but there are instances where there is non-exempt grading. Okay, you've got slopes that were made that are not on the road. You have. You can just look at the picture in our staff report, which apparently was taken several years ago, there's not a blade of grass on that place. Okay? It's been graded. The whole lot. Really four acres. Yes. The, uh, and you're the saying grading. that's less than 400, that's about 400 cubic yards maximum? The, the grading four acres. should have the numbers. I never saw them. But we mm -hmm. don't have them in our staff report. They're not before us as evidence. Nothing is before us. Because it's a receive and file. So I'm ready. I think we should take a vote. And I I think we beat this thing up enough. I think we need a clear answer whether there's a COO. That's yes, a there, is, there was a temporary CO vote issued in, let's see, in June 
June 22nd, 2017. Was it ever final? That's that's even that's before even the, the latest work was happening. The temporary CFO was for the residence that was recently completed. How do you get a temporary CFO five years before recently completed? How do you do that? How do you how do you say, oh, this is occupiable. We're going to take another five years to complete it. Actually, so I'm going to also have the building permit with the inspections. Maybe that might help if you need that information, like what progressed at what point for the primary residents. Well, until, until a CFO is issued, a permanent one, you cannot have two CDPs. You cannot. It's not legal. Okay? So we we are voting on something that's not legal if they don't have a COO. I'm, I'm going to go to Commissioner Peek real quick. I was just going to say... Let's get a vote. Let's get on to the next thing because it sounds like this is coming back for a full CDP. Maybe it's not. I don't know. I'm just, <laughs> you know, we're we're spending a lot of time and we're kind of drifting. Agree. I just I, and I I guess for me it's my it's my first meeting. You know, we want to make these things run smoothly. I can have a side conversation with Richard and clarify my stuff in regards to this moving forward, but. You know, if it says you can't do more than 100,000, I can't wrap my head around that. Um, I just don't know where to go with that. Um, so. So I call the question. Yeah. Ms. Vice Chair Mazza. Yes. Commissioner Hill. Yes. Commissioner Jennings. Nope. Commissioner Peek. Nope. Chair Smith. Nope. Motion fails. Okay. Uh, continue public hearings. We oh, have none. Would someone? No, no, you have to okay. receive. Can I, can I make the motion? Receive the motion. Can I make a motion to approve item 3B2? It's we, it's a receive and file. We don't oh. take a motion. Okay. okay. So we are received and filed. Okay. Thank you. I needed that clarification as well. Okay, very good. Okay, so as we move on to four, uh, which would be continued public hearings, we have none. Uh, 5A, uh, Coastal Development Permit Number 18-026 and Minor Modification Number 20-008. An application for an interior and exterior remodel and second story addition to an existing two-story Beachfront residence with one story detached garage. We have a who's who we have on this one? Me. You have oh, you're back. Okay. So you're kind of books. Okay. Sorry. I didn't see you. Worries. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Chair Smith and Planning Commissioners. This item is a request for a second story addition to an existing um, beachfront residential development located at 521562 PCH. Next slide, please. Depicted here is an aerial photo of the project site. It's an infill property um, located in the La Costa Beach area. Um, the existing development includes an existing one-story garage on the PCH side of the property and a two-story um, single-family residence on the ocean side of the property. Next slide, next slide, please. The scope of work for this CDP includes a 494 square foot second story addition, um, mostly of which will be constructed on top of the garage, which again is on the PCH side of the property. Um, included in that square footage inc also includes an elevated um, hallway that will connect from the second story addition um, to the existing two-story residents. Um, the project also includes replacement of a six-foot high gate um, to be replaced with a, a view permeable um, fence. Next slide, please. Depicted here are some project um, renderings. Um, the lower 
left uh, rendering is probably the best that depicts the scope of the project, again, which includes the second story addition above the existing garage and an elevated um, hallway. Um, the second story addition um, is, is, um, has requested, or well, the applicant has requested a minor modification for that second story addition. Next slide, please. And this and the next slide include a couple of existing um, photos of the surrounding development, most of which um, is pretty close to PCH. Um, this is a, a image looking southeast at the property. Next slide, please. And this image is looking um, southwest of the project site. Again, as you can see, a lot of developments within the area um, is close to, if not abut um, the um, easement for PCH. Next slide, please. Um, to date, staff has received correspondence from two entities, the first of which is from a neighbor who lives across the street from this property. Um, his concern had to do with a previously proposed um, stair tower, which uh, blocks his primary view of the ocean. Um, after expressing that concern to the project team, um, the architect has removed that element from the project. Um, staff also received a letter from MRCA um, requesting um, the owner be required to provide a lateral access um, easement across their property. It's my understanding that the owner is willing to provide this access easement. Um, so staff is also recommending a new, a, an additional condition of approval um, to require the off to dedicate the lateral access. Um, this does conclude my presentation. Um, staff is available to answer any of your questions. Chair Thank Smith, you. Chair Smith, before we take five, or before we open the public hearing, can we take five, please? Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> good good timing thank you okay adjourn for a few minutes seven minutes
Well, we're fucked. It's cold outside. It is very brisk. I stepped out for a second to get some fresh air. And I don't know if that was fresh, but it was cold. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Commissioner Hills just mentioned. I'm missing the button where to put my, oh, never mind. There you go. Okay, back in order. I believe uh, Senior Planner Brooks is going to provide us with a staff report. I I did the staff report right before the break. Oh yeah, sorry about that. You were okay. just about to take disclosures, I believe. That was it, disclosure, sorry. Thank you, Ooh. hate that. <laughs> do, an, do, do an encore. <laughs> yeah, in case you missed anything. Um, disclosures, Commissioner Jennings. He's muted. I don't. None for me, but I have a question. Okay. No, go ahead. Let's take the disclosures. Then. Uh, Vice Chair Mazza. He's muted too. Um. Uh. Com Commissioner Hill. Yeah, I, I drove by, took a walk around from the street and looked at it from different angles and uh, some practical concerns arose, but nothing that's not in the report. Commissioner Peak. I drove by. I also spoke to a property owner that lives uh, across the street and I asked him to send any comments that he had to everybody. For... Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I should also add that I had some questions that were uh, got an answer from, I think, the architect um but we'll discuss these things so okay like i said i spoke to the property owner then i also spoke with our planner about it and he covered stuff that was in the staff report Gee. or talked with richard about it not mrs brooks 
Okay, very Thank good. Um, Rebecca, do we have any speakers? I have a question. Oh, that's right, Commissioner Jennings. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, right. So the way I understood this worked out, the staff report came out, staff recommendation was made, and then at I don't know four o'clock or something like that, we got a letter from the attorney for the MRCA who said. Uh, for this reason, this reason, this reason, and this reason, none of which hold water, you have to uh, require a lateral access from uh, this applicant. And then, Nikki, you say that, okay, they're willing to do that. And so we are now adding a condition requiring the, the, the access. The problem I have is that there is no constitutional theory under which we can require a lateral access in this situation. There is no nexus between what these guys are doing and any access to the coast. And so by requiring it, uh, it seems to me, you know, if they want to give it, that's fine with me, but I don't think the city should be in a position of requiring something we cannot legally require, but we could not legally require if the applicant didn't say, okay, fine, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm good with it. So that's for Richard and Monica and whoever. Yeah, as, as long as we make clear on the record that it was, um voluntarily um, offered by the applicant, then uh, we avoid that um, okay. where, where, would, where would that clarification be in the in the resolution or in uh, in just in our in the record of what we're speaking in, about? In the meeting minutes. Okay. All right. You're happy, I'm happy. That's what I was going to comment on. Um, okay, Vice Chair Maza. No, I was just going to say the applicant did it. We didn't do it. So same okay. thing you just resolved. Okay, Commissioner Peake. Um, is it common practice to allow people to get the um, lateral access easement extorted from them as a condition of approval by another agency? No. It's not. We typically, we typically say we can't do it. Sorry. Yeah, I just don't, I don't know. I don't, I just don't see the the <clears throat> the reason for continuing to give lateral access easements, and then people don't really realize what they're giving away with the right for the public to come up to the their structure indefinitely, and whether or not the homeowner is even being made clearly aware of that. Mind you, for 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 property that they're paying property taxes on. Question. Go ahead. Uh, the, again, the applicant is doing it. His reason for doing it isn't necessarily because they asked him. Uh, in a lot of cases, it's because they don't want to spend a year and a half in coastal because they tend to appeal. It's only not in this case that they may not appeal, but they tend to appeal. I understand we got a letter also from the Coastal Commission. Um, so, we can ask the applicant, do you want to withdraw your your uh, easement after hearing this? But we are not requiring it, and he may have other reasons. A lot of people do it because they don't want to be hassled, and they don't care, because in, especially in this case, where you probably couldn't get to that beach anyway. Uh, so we can ask him, but uh, it's none of our business, really. I think that that beach is very accessible now that there's a large fence that's been come down. I'm just saying. <laughs> For how long? It's in the flood zone and the wave uprush zone. Hundred percent. I don't know. I can get down there pretty easily. Uh, but, uh, Commissioner Hill. Yeah. Uh, well, we should get to the public hearing, but just to say that um, there are seven houses to the west have granted it and three to the east have granted it and others all along that beach. So I don't know, it's kind of six on one half, a dozen on the other. Anyway, public hearing, right? Yep, public hearing. Uh, do we have some speakers? Recording Secretary Evans? Um, yes, we do. So Susan Villain, who is our applicant, uh, I also have present in the meeting, architect Jonathan Day, and I believe the owners were intending to be present, although I don't currently see them here. Um, they don't have a presentation. They are available to respond to questions. And Susan, would you care to make any opening remarks? 
Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, I don't have any remarks. I did speak to Adi, who I believe is uh, watching this, uh, and she did say to me that she would like to um, volunteer the uh, lateral access easement and dedicate that. So, uh, as Renika said, to have as a condition of approval is uh, she's uh, more than happy to agree to. Thank you, Susan. Okay. Uh, our next speaker is Chris DeLue. Go ahead, Chris. Hmm. I no is, longer is Chris, see. Is... I no longer see him in the meeting. It's possible he he signed up for both of those items in error. I don't see him in the meeting. I was going to say, but you know, I don't think this is his. This is not I, his deal, is it? I don't believe so. No, it's not. Um, you never it's know. Just, so but he's there's his name. <laughs> Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak on this item? If so, please click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen now. And seeing none. Okay, back to us, um, commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Hill. Okay, first concern. Um, Looking at the, the how they want to put the second story over the garage, I, it was unclear to me because we don't have plans uh, showing how, the, well, coastal engineering requires that they have piles that are at least 12 feet deep. We don't have plans showing that. And so when I looked at the site, the site is really tight. There's not much room to do anything. And so what what occurs to me and what I need clarification on is, it seems like either some of the piles have to go inside the garage to support that upper structure. Um, so 12 foot deep piles going down through the garage foundation. It's possible that maybe two of them on the west side could be outside the garage, but it strikes me that either the garage may be susceptible to more than 50% um, re redo which would make it a new structure, or um, that it, it maybe it could possibly be done. I don't know how you're going to drill those and get them down 12 feet, but but that would then render a what is now a two-car garage into a one-car garage by making it narrower that way. So I'm, my concern is, how does this practically happen, given that the site is so tight there? Um, I believe the applicant's coastal engineer is on the call that could answer or provide additional feedback to that question. I, I don't know that it's a coastal engineer question as much as it is an architect question. And we did, I did get an answer that said mm -hmm. basically uh, some of them are in the garage and some of them are outside the garage. I, I, I think what I think the implication of the answer is that it renders the two car garage to a one car garage, which is not something we'd be allowed to do. Well, I think Mr. Brown is is a couple of things here. He's coastal and structural, if I'm not mistaken. Is uh, can we go to Mr. Brown and have him speak, please? Good evening, commissioners. Can you hear me? We can. We can. <laughs> okay. Um, to answer uh, Commissioner Hill's concerns, um, basically, we, what we would be doing is underpinning the existing foundations with piles. Right. This is done quite often. And that way we can um, still keep the existing foundation in place. And, but then the support for that um, foundation is down at a deeper level through the piles. Um, and those piles can even be put on the outside um, of the structure. And then we can corbel in to the uh, uh, existing foundation. Okay, on this on the east side, there's no room to put it on the outside, if I'm not mistaken. That you're okay. right, right on the property line, and okay, close enough to it. And then, how if you're putting the piles down inside the garage on the east side, that's taking mm -hmm. up some space. And then, how do you avoid uh, a certain amount of demolition of the garage just to get the gear in there? Because the piles are going to have to come all the way from 12 feet down up 
to the second story to support it. No, that's that's uh, that's not correct. Um, we can um, put the piles down below the slab, um, drill through the slab in two areas, and then corbel off the uh, uh, the piles underneath the existing footings, and hence the exterior walls can then carry the um, the addition that's on the second floor. I see. So your 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 take is that the existing walls are robust enough to support the full second structure. Um, yes, here. that's correct. Right. Okay. Uh, maybe I'm understanding it now. I still I'm still wondering how you'd have room to get down through that foundation with your gear, but th that's a technical matter that's beyond me. We'll we'll invite you. We'll be glad to invite you out there when they're drilling. <laughs> I think they have magicians and leprechauns. <laughs> Um, I, I probably have another question or two, but somebody else can go and come back to me if need be. Uh, Vice Chair Maza. Uh, several questions. One on setback from the road. Uh, obviously, this is sort of on a blind corner, and it's a foot and a half from the, free, the highway. Um, but we can't do anything about that. It exists. But the staff report says the average setback is nine feet. And they're recommending 6.25 feet for the for the second floor. And our common the way we commonly do it is use the average for the neighborhood. So why did the staff allow three feet or so uh, more less setback than is required? Uh, well, staff didn't look, didn't process the minor modification like we would the neighborhood standards request, which is basically it has more defined calculations for for using the average of the neighborhood. Um, staff provided that additional analysis for your staff report just to get a, an understanding of the existing development pattern in the area. Um, in doing the analysis of the second story addition, we didn't deem the request to be um, out of character um, from the existing neighborhood. Well, why wouldn't it be out of character if it is out of character? If the average is nine, why isn't it, why isn't that in character? The requirement is much more than that. It's 12 and a half. Yes, and doing well, the I can visual... understand the setback changing, but when you add an addition, you have to follow the current codes or the average of the neighborhood standard. You either have the neighborhood standard or the current codes. You don't have something in between. And it's this not a discretionary thing. It's, you don't just pick it out of the air. Um, you did the analysis, said it was nine feet, and then it comes in at six and a quarter. So which method did you use? Well, it was, it's approximately nine feet, and that's based on staffs re, um, reviewing information the applicant team provided and also doing some measuring from the city's GIS system. So it, the neighborhood standards um, request, it, it comes with, it requires a more formal documentation where an architect actually goes out and measures setbacks and provides some type of authentication for that information. Um, the minor modification uh, request has somewhat of a, a lower threshold. Um, and if you look at the findings required for the minor modification, they're not as strict as those required for like a neighborhood standards request or variance. But a minor modification wouldn't allow six and a quarter feet. The requirement's 12 and a half. The minor modification allows the required front yard setback to be reduced by no more than 50%. So the required front yard setback for this property is 12 and a half feet based on the survey, and they've requested to have that reduced by half and half. Sort of. So on a, on a highway where you're a foot and a half from the highway, where obviously you're taking your life in your hand backing out, Staff just said, oh, that's okay? Or did they do any kind of analysis 
on what, in other words, you just told me that the applicant gave you the information and said, can I do this? But nothing was checked. Staff did cross check using the city's GIS system. And this is a second story addition. It's not on the ground. So if the concern is maybe um, obstructing um, line of sight from people traveling, um, I guess technically that would be east on PCH. It's a second story addition. So that wasn't really deemed to be an issue. Well, the reason I'm asking is because the, also in the planning report, they say the entire property is in the wave uprush zone and the flood zone. So it's entirely possible we lose the bottom floor, which would make the upper setback the deciding issue. Um, and therefore, they could rebuild underneath it at six and a half feet, six and a quarter feet instead of 12 and a half. So I'm, I'm just looking, you know, you're, you're talking about a property that is going to have a problem in 100 years. I don't know if we did a, I didn't look through the wave uprush. I don't know if we counted 100 years or not. But um, anything that's 100% in the wave uprush and 100% in the flood zone, I think needs to have consideration about how far you jam it up against the highway. But that's just a question. I got my answer. Um, maybe, now, maybe you could propose an amendment that says that any potential future garage can be no closer to the highway than the existing garage. But you guys, if just all you have to do is look at the picture on page two of 19, every house, and we drive by these houses every day and think, oh, my God, I'd hate to live there because you can't back out. What are you guys talking about here? You guys, there's nothing to talk about. You know what I'm talking about? The house directly next door, if you look at that picture. Yeah, they're right next to the road, Vice Chair. I, oh, I that, that house. That. Any, where do you think the nine-foot setback comes? It comes from that house being much more than that. It doesn't matter. It's on top of the garage. And everybody else on this road is right up against the highway. Yeah, I just I just happen to believe in following codes and standards that we no, you should not, do. That's all. You missed it. And I said I got my answer. Can, and can, the answer was can I say something? Yeah. Go ahead, Commissioner Pete. Isn't the garage already existing? It is. So what's the issue? There isn't one. The issue one. is the setback on the second floor. The second back That's on. The, I, I, okay, so. But your concern with the setback structure. on the second floor is, is got it. Okay. Yeah, okay. Now, um, second thing is this, this project has a roof deck. Doesn't say so anywhere in the staff report until you start looking at the the uh, plans, but I see absolutely no way to get to the roof. There's no stairway. Well, they took the stair they took the stair tower out. Okay, so how why are we approving a roof deck with no way to get to it? I would, I'd like to go to Mr. Day. Uh, Mr. Day, can you uh, Rebecca? Can you unmute him, please? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. can Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for your time tonight. Um, if you look at the second floor plan, there's an, a stairway that's an exterior open air stair to get to the roof deck proposed. So we did take the stair tower off, but the stair still remains that will allow you access to the roof above. Can you tell us what plan that is? Because it doesn't show up on your, your elevations at all. It'll show up on... Um, a one proposed floor plans A three A. Okay, and Renika, was that? Let me find it. But was that counted in the square footage? The roof deck? No, the stairway. It's an exterior, it was, exterior stairway. It was part. It's part of the second floor addition. It's part of that four hundred and something square feet. That's correct. Where is that shown on it? You say it's on A4A. Where? I don't see it. A3A. A3A. A, 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 A3B. A3A. Okay. Uh, is it in the front half of the building or the back half of the building? Or It's in the middle of the there? building, but where is the door? Where, what, where is the exterior door? The, the, the stairs are all exterior stairs. Oh, 
Oh, I believe I misspoke. I think it's part of the existing um, second floor area. My apologies for that. It's um, there's a stairway to the second floor that doesn't exist. <laughs> Not right now. It's in the house. Right. I mean, it's on that. Well, I don't see anything that says stairway. That's my only question. A three A. Yeah. Well, he's got this, he shows the stairs. Top or bottom? Second floor. Yeah. Top of the page. Top of the page. Middle of the plan. Yeah, it's kind of shaded in gray. Yeah. Okay, so that's an addition, and that is counted. Jonathan, uh, would it be fair? Perhaps this would help. For the benefit of the commission, the the stairway. I must, if I understand your plans, is it correct to say that there's a a door at the second floor, and you open that door, and then you have an open to the sky stairwell that goes to the roof. Is is that if I understand the plans correctly, Jonathan? That's correct. So from the second floor, you're going to a landing, and then from the landing, going up the stairs. So that's just not shown in your uh, in your your A one A three A second floor middle plan everything shaded is counted as square footage. Okay, I'm just saying your A O point one does just doesn't show it at all. Doesn't show a, a deck or anything. A so that's just old old information. A one is a uh, roof plan. It's on the bottom. It says proposed roof plan on A one. No, I'm talking about the sheet the, above that inner courtyard view, left view, front view, aerial. That's, that just didn't have a, 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 a deck, right? That's why I can't find it on there. I'm not sure which sheet you're referring to. Are you talking to. about elevations, Vice Chair, or are you talking, about, talking about, about the, 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 oh, the renderings? Yeah. About the renders. yeah, the renderings. There is no roof deck. Okay, now. Are there any restrictions on the roof deck? Is it like all other roof decks? Uh, you, you have to follow um, Dark Skies Ordinance. It must be on a timer. It must be uh, active, uh, occupied to be lit. It's got to go off at 10 o'clock, all that kind of stuff, like we do, do did at uh, sea level and all those other houses. Is that in the... Uh, like, John, I'm pretty sure that the dark sky ordinance covers any exterior lighting in a roof yeah, that is considered yeah. part of the exterior lighting. Right, but I uh, we have to make sure on these because that's a new ordinance that not everything has. No, not everybody has it. We've already done a bunch of houses like that. Is there any restriction on what you can leave on it? We've always said no, no umbrellas, no furniture, no this, no that. Only if they exceed Over, the height. It exceeds the height. But we don't have a height limitation. Isn't the height yes, limitation 24 feet or no? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, it's, it's so, so, feet. so nothing, so just to be clear that there should be something written in there, John, is what you're saying, that nothing can exceed the 24 feet that's furniture or anything on the roof deck? Correct. That's what we've always done in the past. Is there anything like that in there? I don't believe so, but we're we're happy to include at a condition. And just to clarify, the finished roof can be no higher than 24 feet, but for beachfront development, the roof deck railing can go up to 25 feet. And is there that's any an interpretation or is it in the code? That's in the code. Another question, is there any uh, railing that's going on this roof deck? Because I don't see it in the elevation. Yeah, that is the rally. Let's see. Let me see if I can. There, there is in some of the pictures. It's th it's three and a half feet. Yeah, there's a glass. Am I reading the plans correctly here? I'm looking at A three B, and I see forty two inch high tempered glass rail. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Um, now. Uh, I'll pass for a while. Get back to Craig. Commissioner Hill? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, Bonnie asked us several times to refer to the general plan more often, and I've done some of this spiel previously on a different project, but 
The word privacy appears 14 times in the general plan. The word private appears 126 times. And we have in the vision and mission statement, the need to protect the privacy of property owners. We have land use objective and land use policies 6.1 and 6.1.1, stating that the right to reasonable use of one's property, including the right to quiet enjoyment and privacy protected. Um, there's a couple other things I could quote here, but the point being, um, the house on the west side has a big sort of private pool deck that this rooftop deck would be looking right down in over. And I, I think there's a distinction in terms of what's reasonable privacy between when you'd have a beachfront house that everybody has a deck out on the front end and you can all kind of see across to the other deck next door. But when, when on the other hand, the house on the east side, where that deck extends back into the site and has the pool and it is a more private space than being out on the beach, um, having this roof deck looming right over it seems to be really pushing the limit of, of what, are we protecting privacy? I'm, I'm, I'm just not comfortable to say this is uh, not an invasion of the neighbor's privacy the way that that pre-existing structure is set up already. Has that neighbor commented on this project at all? Yeah, that's a good question at all. Because if they haven't commented, they might not be aware. If they have commented on something else, then then maybe that suggests they don't care. And whose fault is that if they don't check their mail? Um, I don't know if Jonathan or Susan are on the call, if they've done any, like, due diligence with neighbors as they were developing the plans, just to, I don't know if they reached out to see if there were any concerns it, it would be good to see typically on roof on roof decks you guys we've heard from people immediately and we right, I don't yeah. see anything here so i'm i'm going with the fact that these folks are okay with this and well, but 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 the staff report does not mention roof deck that's part of the problem and, and it didn't we didn't get that until we got a drawing in the email that said oh there's a railing on that roof now so it could be they looked at it they saw some previous plans they said yeah we're cool with it and they didn't really realize it so it, this all hinges on the word reasonable, right? Like, and maybe they have talked to the neighbor and the neighbor's cool with it. So that would be good to hear. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Villane, do you have anything, any, uh, you know, an answer to, for Commissioner Hill on that? Or do, are the neighbors good? Do, can you help us there, please? Yes, um, I know from speaking with the owner that the neighbors that you're referring to, they're business partners and best friends, and <laughs> which is nice. Uh, also, they, uh, the the owners of this property, um, the applicant, they look down on that pool anyway. So from the structure, so having the roof deck is is sort of irrelevant. Well, not so much. I mean, they, they don't. Yeah. Okay. It's a question of noise also. I mean, if they're already looking down on them or have that ability to look at the pool, which has been an existing condition for probably the last 30 years, um, adding the roof deck, I don't feel is going to, you know, make the situation any worse. But you're saying that they are they are aware of the roof deck specifically, yeah. not simply that, uh, that I don't know. I don't know if uh, I mean, like I said, they're business partners and friends. I'm sure over the last what three years this project's been at the city, they've had many communications and conversations about the project. How long has the roof deck been in the plan? Um, I don't honestly know. I'd have to ask the given, architect. Given that it's not on the render, Mr. Day, can you answer that, please? Yep. Can you unmute me? Yes. Oh, yeah. okay. I'm there. Um, the the roof deck's been on the plans for about a year. Um, there has been a roof deck that was proposed um, with the stair tower, which we already briefly discussed. Um, by right, the neighbor, Chris Hansen, across the street um, doesn't have any view, potential or view rights. But we went ahead and, yes. and took the stair tower out. Yeah, yeah, that that wasn't the concern. But right. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll raise my hand. 
Go ahead, uh, Ms. Villain. Go ahead, Ms. Villain. I just spoke with Audie, the homeowner, and she said, yes, the neighbors are well aware of the roof deck. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Great, uh, Commissioner Jennings. Yeah, I just wanna comment on what I see as a bit of a, of a confusion here about what this body is and isn't. Um, the general plan does talk a lot about all kinds of things. And it says, these are our goals. And then these are the way we're gonna implement it. They, and, and the decision maker in that case is the city council, not the planning commission. The implementation measures are put forward and elected by the, and, and adopted by the people that the city's uh, elected to make those decisions. Um, if all of a sudden it's a carte blanche to say, well, you know, the whole general plan, you know, it talks a lot about this, it talks a lot about that. So I'm going to import a bunch of new restrictions uh, or a bunch of different restrictions or a bunch of different things because I think that that will will carry out the goal of the general plan in a better manner is not really what we're here for. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, that's my point on this whole well, issue of privacy. I'd like to comment in, on that. In answer, the general plan is the code and you're, 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 you you raise a good point about interpretation and what, what can you read into that or not and how, how specific can you be? But my, my specific point on this item is that the right to reasonable privacy, quiet enjoyment, et cetera, it's pretty clear what something that we're we're trying to yeah yeah I, but uh, let me just let me just make the point again the general plan contains goals and 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 things that we're trying to do aspirations and that it also in, contains implementation measures it's the implementation measures that we're bound to follow not the goals and aspirations it's the implementation measures that the city council puts in place that's what we're supposed to follow Vice Chair Mazza. The general plan is adopted by the city council as part of the municipal code. It's it's chapter one. It is in there. Look it up. Chapter one. Okay. And we have to certify that this project follows the municipal code. Okay. So you can say, gee, that shouldn't be the way it is or not. But we have to vote to follow the general plan. Now, obviously there's no specific things in there about every little ticky tacky thing. That's why it's a general plan. But to say, gee, you can't follow the general plan. You can't even mention it because this and that, and then ask us to vote to certify that this is approved by the general plan. It's, I mean, by the municipal code. If it violates the general plan, that's in the municipal code. It's codified. Okay. Maybe and when the we, city maybe. council did not have to vote to put it in. Okay. They did not have to, but it is chapter one. So it's in there. <laughs> when we have the, uh, the, the, the lessons on, on, uh, on the Brown Act, maybe we can include uh, a chapter on on the difference between implementation measures and goals, but here. Yeah, and, but one of the things they will say is, a, a municipal code is an implementation measure, and we can ask our attorney right now. And, and I'm sorry, a municipal code by the city council is implemented. <laughs> and and I'm sorry, I was muted, but I was referring to a policy in the general plan, not not one of the <laughs> objectives. So if it's a policy, we're supposed to follow it. Okay, can I ask a question from what Susan just said? Hang on, let, let Commissioner Pete go first. Go ahead, Commissioner. <coughs> he can ask his question first. He was going before me. All right, go ahead, Vice Chair. Well, you were, and I know this is probably beating a dead horse, but um, we were told that the house already looks on the pool. But when you look at right elevation, there's no windows. So I don't know how they got up to the roof to look at the pool, but there's no windows on the right view on this A01. I just want to point that out because we were told that they, they can look at it all they want right now. Yeah, that's really true. Look at the render. Okay, um, Mr. Chair? Yes. I'm going to move the staff recommendation. 
Can I would like to make a second and and uh, uh, request additional uh, conditions. One, that a lateral easement is is given, which the applicant asked for. Two, that we have specific references to the dark sky ordinance, so we don't get into this. Uh, gee, it was they drew it before th this got vote or that vote or whatever, because the dark sky. Uh, ordinance covers forever backwards. Okay, there is no grandfather. They're voting. They're voting. Okay. Okay. And then, okay. Uh, okay. 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 Gotta go. And then the third, third condition I'd like to include in this is that nothing, no physical I, uh, barrier, no physical uh, furniture or barrier may exceed twenty-five feet. Which is what the code says, including an umbrella. Yeah, umbrellas, chairs, barbecues, etc. Haven't we? It, it, well, first of all, uh, I, I take it you're asking for a friendly amendment, right? And uh, with regard to the first item, I'm happy to include that. With regard to the, uh, what was the second one? Dark sky. Dark sky. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, this is this becomes a really. Um, destructive habit because then the next time you see a uh, a resolution or a permit that doesn't include the language, the argument's got to be made, well, you know, you put it into this one, how, why didn't you put it into that one? If it's a law of general applicability, you don't put it into each ordinance because just for that very reason, because you're creating ambiguity. So I'm not going to go along with that one. The third one, um, yeah, I'm I'm okay with that, except that I think what we've done in the past is say that uh, nothing can remain uh, more than 24 hours or, or on a 24-hour cycle. Because you can go up there and you can put an umbrella up, but you have to take it down uh, at sundown or whatever it is. You can't you can't keep it up for a full day. That's I think what we've done in the past. But um, if yeah, if you're okay with that, it has to go down at night. Uh, yeah. Now, I just have a question on that. I'm fine with that. Uh, if Richard tells us that it's not a violation of the 25 foot rule. If I understand. Would you go up there and you got a, a, a roof that's 24 and a half feet and you put up a whole bunch of umbrellas and chairs and tables and all this stuff and all of a sudden you're 27 feet. Uh, Jeff's, Jeff's proposal to my request is, oh, you can do that for 24 hours. And yes, I'm wondering, is, is that legal? And is, does it cause a compliance issue? In, in general, we have not been regulating things you can pick up and move easily, like a chair or an umbrella. Uh, definitely, if they tried to put a storage shed up there or build a built-in barbecue, uh, height, because those are permanent structures, height's definitely is, uh, an issue. I cannot recall the address off the top of my head. I don't know if Renika has it. I want to say it was, I think, sea level or broad beach. Uh, Correct, sea level. Area. Sea uh, level. We did, as Commissioner Jennings has pointed out, unless I'm mistaken, I believe that we put a condition on the project that nothing could be uh, could be stored it could be placed up there used and then had to come down uh and in terms of enforcement uh because of the the temporary nature and moving around yes it could be hard for us uh, unless someone leaves it up there permanently but if we receive photographs or something from the neighbor we would definitely follow up on it so i would ask jeff to include in number three have you, that be the exact language that we used at sea line or sea, le sea level. It's actually was off of sea level. I'm not sure that was the address, but you know the house. We spent an hour on it, on that one particular yeah, item. Yeah, it's more we important than Renika know the house. Would you, the, do you know which one we're talking about, Renika? I do not. I was just going to go. Was it a recent um, item before you? About a year ago. <clears throat> it was. It was a... Flag lot off of sea level. God, Richard knows it. So I, I 
just saying we, we use that language so we're consistent. I yeah. think Scott, I think Scott Halley was the contractor. Yeah, she was Scott Brooks. Halley. Okay. Uh, Those Commissioner, Commissioner okay. Peek, hang on. Commissioner okay. Peek's had his hand up. No? Yes? There you go. Uh, I was just... Because your hand was up, so I, I asked... Oh, you. my bad, my bad, my bad. Okay, there you go. Mi Commissioner Jennings. Nope, my bad, my bad. Okay. <laughs> okay, so but I didn't get quite get an answer for our our vote. Uh, can yeah, we that, that's, that language that, 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 consistent? That's that. Yes, we can make it completely consistent with with that if if we can find it. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. we can find it. <laughs> we'll find okay, it. That's that. Thank you very much. So number one and number three is in. Uh, with, one and number three are in. So can we take a roll call, please? I, I still have a comment. My hand is up. No, it is. Head Commissioner Hill. Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, I, I think it, with respect to the privacy concern, this one is distinguishable from the ones that we've approved that we just talked about, the sea level and the one over on uh, uh, hanging over Ramirez Canyon, because they were far enough away that, yeah, you could put reasonable restrictions on it and make it work. I think this one is a little bit more like the one over on Sea Star that was in the plan and there was some discussion when the neighbors found out about it, it was like, whoa, wait a minute. And the applicant pulled the uh, the roof deck off the plan. I'd be happy to vote for the rest of this plan without the roof deck in it. Not on my motion, I'm not gonna accept it. That's a friendly amendment. I, I know, I'm just putting, put it, I, well, I, I know nobody's, I'm not gonna get three votes on that, but I'm just stating my, my view regarding the privacy issue. Okay, hey. thank you. Um, according to Secretary Evans, may we take a roll call, please? With yes, for the approval of the project with amendment number one and three that Vice Chair Maza and Commissioner Jennings both agreed on. Can I just ask, um, Planning Director Malika if he is confident that we can identify the specific language that they're referencing? I'm not familiar with the project. Yeah, what we can do, uh, and I guess, Monica, I want to make sure I don't speak out of turn, and, and if needed, I guess we could give me a second, I can try to find it, uh, but my thoughts are that if if in the amended motion tonight, if there's a way to just uh, direct staff to pull up, uh, to to pull the language uh, from a previous project, I, I believe it was sea level, uh, regarding the deck, if if that was enough direction to put uh, in their action for us to basically cut and paste that condition uh, from a previous resolution and include it in this one, uh, or would it be best if we took a moment for staff to try to find that language and have it read uh, word for word into the record? I can give you the address. That would be very helpful. It's 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 either 31571 sea level or there's some ambiguity about whether that's the neighbor, but so it would be either 31571 or adjacent. Okay. We can definitely and, uh, get it from that. I'd like to I don't think this has to be in the resolution while you're looking at have that in your files as a standard resolution. Mm -hmm. So in the future we can do the same thing and everybody knows what's coming at them. Um instead of trying to tweak it every time. We can always tweak it, but uh, if we have standard resolutions on file somewhere, it's a lot easier. Okay, um, so Chair Smith, had you, would you like me to call the roll? Please. Did you find it? Do you want to read it or not? Oh, well, I'm I'm just saying with those with at least an address on a road, I can search those properties tomorrow and identify the language, okay. but I have so not found it right now. Rather than leave it hanging in the air like this, is there a way we can we can make it a alternative situation where Richard, you you identify we've identified the property, we've identified the project, we've identified the, the relevant language, but if you can't find it or if there's some confusion, you could bring a resolution back to us at our next meeting on the consent calendar. Would that make sense? Only if you can't find it. Yeah. Uh, I don't believe it was 31571. Uh, 
It was in that area and perhaps the house next door. Yeah, it's a flag lot. It could be the adjacent one. Yeah, I did that project in 2015. <laughs> so that was a, <laughs> Yeah, I know. I looked at that one. It had, an, it had an exterior stairway. Um it was white. Yeah. <laughs> and it was Scott, it was Scott Halley. And the problem on Google Earth is it, it it does give the address for the one on the same flag, but not for this one. And and yeah, it is two houses. If you went to the city GIS, you'd see it right away. It's a flag lot. Yeah. May, may I suggest that whatever um, commissioners have in mind about the height condition and deck conditions that were imposed on, on this sea level project, just uh, paraphrase what, what you think that is for the record so we can adopt it as a condition. And it sounds like it, it's, you know, ha imposing a condition of height per code um, on the deck level, provided that the um, any patio or movable um, structures are not uh, static for um, twenty four hour period, is that well? What you have in mind? I agree with you, but uh, we came up with very specific language. They'll so, find it. I think Jeff's solution is if you can't find it, come back with. Some version of it in a consent calendar, and if it's way off, if it's not what you want, then can't you just correct the record on that at a future date? Where the consent well, it gets it gets yeah. pretty complicated for the applicant if we start if we keep screwing around with the thing. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair so enough. So if you, if Jeff, I... if you come back with a consent calendar, uh, I think I found. I, the I know language. you can find it. I know you can find it. I I, 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 be, I believe I may have found the language. I'm just trying to navigate into the correct oh. part of the resolution. Um, yeah, I would nothing be, left overnight on the proposed rooftop deck may exceed 18 feet in height above finished or natural grade, whichever is lower. Yeah, that's a problem. We just, we have a different number here. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, it's, it depends on the zoning, and that's that was the maximum yeah. height for that. Without a variance, so this one will be twenty four or twenty five. Twenty five. That's not beachfront. Twenty five. Twenty five. Yeah. So that language, but with twenty five feet instead, right? Right. Yes. Okay. I, I just want to be clear when we're saying twenty, it can't exceed twenty five feet. Isn't the roof deck? So you're basically saying that you could not have an umbrella because the umbrella is going to be. Significantly you, over twenty four. You can but leave you, it. You can have it, but you can't leave it overnight. You got to take it. Okay. Okay. Good. Exactly. Okay. We, I think we're good. Okay. Okay. We haven't voted yet, have we? Do we have to vote? Oh, right we're now. we're about to do that. So, Commissioner Jennings. Yes. Vice Chair Mazza. Yes. Commissioner Hill. No. Commissioner Peak. Yes. Chair Smith. Yes. Motion carries. I move we adjourn. I'm going to second. second that. Take a roll call, please. Vice Chair Mazza. Yes. Chair Commissioner Jennings. Yes. Commissioner Hill. Yes. Commissioner Peak. Yes. Chair Smith. Yes. Motion carries. You are adjourned. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Stay, Stay warm gentlemen. and dry. Stay warm and dry. Fun, isn't it, Skyler? <laughs> <laughs> Good night, guys. Good night.